We. All right, we're recording. No. Lynn. Okay. Be kind. We can see. Lynn. I sent Lynn to the text. Everybody, mm -hmm. everybody okay. should raise their Ready? hands. Okay, let's raise your hands. Uh, it is September twelfth, twenty two thousand twenty two. <laughs> There's a variety of hands up that I'm seeing, and they can't hear me. No, no, we, we can. can hear you. You can't can hear, hear, us. hear us. We can't hear them. They can hear. We can't hear them. Okay, let's do chat. How do I do chat? We, you have to unmute, and we're going to check it. See we're if unmuted. We can hear us. We're unmuted. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Alicia, I like your hair. There we go. A little. Pat, thank you. <laughs> um, oh, they can hear us. Thank you. We can hear you. Okay. okay. Oh, thank okay. You. All right. Thanks. We're going to restart. <laughs> um, it is September 12th, 2022. And uh, based on an act passed back in July, uh, they extended the open meeting law provisions that allow us to continue meeting remotely without a quorum of the council physically present at the meeting location while providing the public with adequate alternative access to the meeting. This meeting is accessible in real time via Zoom, the phone, and on Amherst Media. And I wanna note that we do have a quorum in the room. Given that we have a quorum of the council present both in the room and on Zoom, uh, I am calling the September 12th, 2022 regular meeting of the town council to order at 636. I'll call upon each councilor by name. At that time, you should unmute your mic and say present, uh, and then make sure you mute it again. Uh, we want to do this so that we can make sure we can hear you and you can hear us. Shalini Balmil. Present. Pat DeAngelis. Present. Anna Devlin Gothia. Present. Lynn Griesmer is present. Mandy Johanneke. Present. Anika Lopes. Present. Michelle Miller. Present. Dorothy Pam. Here. Pam Rooney. Present. Kathy Shane. Here. Andy Steinberg. Present. Jennifer Taub. Present. Alicia Walker. Present. But the record show that all 13 counselors are present this evening. There is no chat room for this meeting. If you have technical issues, please let Athena and me know. And we will make sure that we decide what we're going to do at that point. To make a comment or ask a question, you're going to use the raise hand button. Uh, and we will suspend discussion if there are technical difficulties. Um, we're going to quickly go through the announcements that are in your thing, in your packet. They're up here. But while you're looking at that, let me add to this list. There is a budget coordinating group on Wednesday, September 21st at 4.30. Uh, the bid block party is this Thursday at 5 o'clock. And it will be up and down the entire main area of downtown. And the 50th anniversary of the Amherst Farmers Market is this Saturday with comments and events uh, being all morning into the afternoon, but a program at 10 o'clock. Senator Joe Comerford will be at the Jones Library on Saturday, September 17th also, uh, starting at 1030. On September 23rd, we will be celebrating Puerto Rican Heritage Day. And uh, that will be in front of town hall at 10 o'clock. And please keep watch for notices of the beginning of the town manager's annual evaluation. We have no hearings tonight. I wanna to note that there are 14 people in the audience and I'm now going to move to general public comment and ask people who would like to make comment. This is the only public comment this evening. If you would like to make public comment, please raise your hand. At present, I'm not seeing any hands being raised. Okay. 
Uh, then we are going to go on to the consent agenda, which is item five of our agenda. The following items were selected because they were considered to be routine and reasonable to expect they would pass with no controversy. If you would like to remove an item, please let me know after I read the initial, the motion, the original motion. Um, that does not require a second. To move the following items into the printed motions, motions there under and approve those items as a single unit. 6A, adoption of Puerto Rican Heritage Day proclamation. 8C, referral of general bylaw 3.40, snow and ice removal. Let me note that this is a referral to GOL who would like to look at it more thoroughly than initially referred back in 2018-19 on the list. So it's a referral. 8E, adoption of amendments to general bylaws 3.8, license fees in holders, common vitulars, and lunch carts. Tonight will be the second reading. We've already had the first reading. The rescission of general bylaw 8F, the rescission of general bylaw 3.23, peeking or peering into the place of habitation. And again, this is second reading tonight. We had the first reading uh, back in August. 11A to F, approval of the following town council meeting minutes. June 6, 2022, special town council meeting minutes, public forum on the capital improvement plan. June 6, 2022, regular town council meeting minutes. June 13th, 2022, special town council meeting minutes, public forum on Centennial Water Treatment Facility funding. June 13th, 2022, regular town council meeting minutes. June 27th, 2022, special town council meeting minutes, public forum on appropriation for North Common Improvements. June 27th, 2022, regular town council meeting minutes. Are there any questions or, I'm sorry, are there any items that counselors would like removed? Please raise your hand. Seeing none, I'm going to seek a second to that motion. Second, Devlin Gothier. Thank you. Any further comments? Then we're going to move on to the roll call vote. Um, we'll begin with Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. Lynn Griesmers and I, Mandy Joe Haneke. Aye. Anika Lopes. Aye. Michelle Miller. Aye. Dorothy Pam. Yes. Pam Rooney. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Jennifer Taub. I'm sorry, Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Aye. Alicia Walker. Aye. Shalini Balmil. Yes. Okay. Thank you. I'd like to ask at this time that Pam Rooney read the final uh, paragraph of the resolution regard uh, the proclamation regarding Puerto Rican Heritage Day. Thank you. It says, now, therefore, we, the Amherst Town Council, officially proclaim September 23, 2022, as Puerto Rican Heritage Day, and further recognizing this proclamation by raising the Puerto Rican flag from September 23 to September 29, 2022, to help cultivate awareness for all residents of Amherst. Thank you. And if any of you have joined us in the past, it's a very colorful day and various schools bring students in to help celebrate that. Um, we're going on to the presentations and discussions. And I wanna note this is one of two changes in the order of the agenda. The items will still happen. They just won't happen in the same order. We're going to do the Jones Building Project first. And then later on in the evening, we will actually talk about the town manager's evaluation timeline. So uh, with that, uh, Athena, we sent you a very late presentation that we were updating. And um, Paul, did you have anything you wanted to say to begin with? 
Okay. Let me just also start while we're getting that. We are not taking any action tonight. Um, there is a finance committee meeting tomorrow at which point this will be the topic of discussion. And we will be meeting again next Monday night at which point we will possibly conclude discussion of this topic for the moment. Um, tonight, we're going to begin to answer but not complete all of the answers to the questions, even remotely. In fact, we have not received written answers to the questions. So if you still have questions you would like to ask, you can raise them this evening or you can email them to me, but please finish emailing me any additional questions by no later than probably noon tomorrow. Okay. So I think it's important for all of us on the council especially those counselors who were not on the council back in April of 2021 to understand the timeline for the library. I've derived this from all of the materials that you've been given and checked it with the library uh, director. Please move to the next slide. So this history for the Jones goes all the way back to 2013-14. Uh, MBLC put out an RFP. Uh, the town approved award, um, applying to that. It was for a planning and design grant. Uh, the initial amount awarded by MBLC or Mass Board of Library Commissioners was 50K. And the town matched that with another 25K. There's a lot of things that took place then between 2013 and 14, all the way to 2017, but I didn't want to give you all of that in these slides. You've been sent all of that and it is in your links to it is in are in your packet. Um, in 2017, town meeting approved the preliminary design and authorized a construction grant for proposal and MBLC did award that grant provisionally. We were on a wait list. We moved up to number two on that wait list in 2019. Um, repair estimates were then asked for by the town and they updated existing repair estimates and added to it the accessibility study because those repairs would trigger the need to add accessible um, access. On April 5th of 2021, the town council voted to authorize the bond. We voted CPA money and we voted to uh, authorize the town manager to enter into an MOU. After a variety of different events on November 2nd, 2021, uh, we did place a question on the ballot and affirming the town council's vote and 75% of those voting voted in favor. Just this past summer, we've received new estimates and there has been a serious increase in costs. In a moment, Sean Mangano will speak to that. Um, the next step in this process is the preparation of schematic design and bids and I'm sorry, and construction documents those would go out to bid and there would not be an estimate that is reliable until the summer of 2023 when the bids are received. Next slide. This is just a summarization of the three votes that the council took on April 5th of 2021. One was a million dollars for the CPA. Uh, the second was the bond authorization for the total project. And the third was authorizing the town manager to enter into an MOU based on the fundraising that the library is in process of doing. Next slide. Sean, this is yours. Is Sean in the room? I don't think so. I believe he's in attendees. Yeah, please bring Sean into the room.
Hi, can you uh, hear me? We can, Sean. Sorry about that. I was screaming from the audience, but nobody let me in. That's all right. Um, <laughs> thank you, Lynn. Um, so I'm just going to start from the bottom and, and work up. Um, so just some terms you'll see on the coming charts. Uh, soft costs are part of part of the total project budget. This includes things like designer fees, OPM fees, uh, fee um, permits and relocation costs, estimates, surveys. Um, pretty much everything that's sort of non-actual construction falls under soft costs. Hard costs are the actual construct um, the contract for construction and any related costs like site work. Um, those terms are important because what we currently have um, is a two independent cost estimates for hard costs. We don't have an independent cost estimate for soft costs. We, we do have an estimate for soft costs provided by our OPM, um, but the, the estimates that we just recently obtained as part of schematic design um, were for just hard costs. Um, so we did get two cost estimates, one by the architect's cost estimator, Fennessy, and one by the town's cost estimator, RLB. And then the the way it works is they kind of look at the two of them and find the midpoint to come up with a reconciled estimate. So the numbers you're going to see on the next two slides are that midpoint of the, the two cost estimates. Um, and we have added in the OPM's cost estimate for soft costs to get to a total project cost. Um, and then the last thing is the approved budget, which is basically what the town council has authorized in terms of debt so far, um, including CPA funding, the MBLC grant funds, and, and the original goal for fundraising. Next slide. So this chart compares uh, sort of the cost side of the equation um, from the approved budget to the, the new reconciled cost estimate. So the approved budget total was 36.3 million. Um, comprised of about 9.4 in soft costs and 26.9 million in hard costs. The new reconciled cost estimate again, which is sort of that, that midpoint between the two independent cost estimates is for 46.4 million. Um, the, the growth is largely in the hard costs um, going from 26.9 up to 36.3 uh, at the midpoint. Um, we've talked to the OPM about the soft costs and whether they should rise proportionally. A big part of the soft costs are the designer contracts and the OPM contracts, which based on what um, discussions with the OPM will stay what they currently are. Um, so a big chunk of that original 9.4 is sort of fixed um, since it's for those two contracts. Next slide. So one thing I should have mentioned on the prior slide. So that midpoint cost estimate has already been reduced for some reductions that the Jones Library Building Committee has approved. Um, at their last meeting uh, last Thursday, I think the 8th, um, they, the committee sort of gave tentative approval to about 1.9 million of cost reductions. Um, and I, if it's not in this packet, it'll be in the packet for tomorrow, the breakdown of what those um, reductions are. Um, so this chart shows the funding side of it. So again, approved budget, there was 1 million from CPA, 13.9 million MBLC grant, 15.8 was going to be the town share funded by debt, and then the trustees fundraising um, goal was 5.6, which includes the historic tax credits. Uh, with the using the new reconciled estimate, um, basically the CPA, MBLC, and town share stay the same, and the uh, the source that has to increase to cover the the increased costs is the the trustees fundraising target, which grows to 15.7 again at the midpoint. So. Um, Best case scenario could come in a little bit lower. Worst case scenario could it could come in higher. And Sean, that, you did point it. out that this actually is amended since you showed these slides to the finance committee last Tuesday. Yeah, so we shared uh, a version of these slides with the finance committee on Tuesday. Um, the next day, Wednesday, the OPM worked up a new cost estimate for soft costs, which has been included here. So you're seeing uh, what, what he worked up. Um, and then on Thursday, the, the Jones Library Building Committee approved those additional cost reductions, which are reflected here. So there's been a couple of things that have happened since the last Finance Committee meeting that are reflected in these figures. Which are now lower than what we saw last Tuesday. Yeah, it's lower by about $2 million from the from the Finance Committee last Tuesday. Okay, I just wanna make sure for Finance Committee members and other counselors that have either were there or watched it since then that they knew of the difference. Kathy, we're gonna to get to questions in a moment. Yeah, just I'm just 
on, on this, do we have in the packet exactly what those cuts were, Sean? Uh, if it, I'll double I mean, check. The difference, if not, the difference we'll make, between what we saw last week and this week. Yeah, so we can provide a, um, so just to go over the sort of difference in methodology. So when I shared the numbers last Tuesday, um, last Tuesday at Finance Committee for soft costs, I just basically took the percentage um, from the original budget, the percentage of um, hard costs that were being, that were budgeted for soft costs, which is about 30 four percent or so um, was what was budgeted in our original approved budget. Um, I then took the higher cost estimate and applied that same percentage. Um, working with the OPM, um, doing a more detailed granular look, it can't, it's come in a little bit lower. So that's the biggest reason for the difference and why it's a little bit lower um, is lower soft costs from what you saw on Tuesday. Paul, did you have a comment on this? I just want to note that um, there's a, a typo on one, on one of the early slides. It, the measure passed in November of 2021 by 65% of the vote, I believe not 75%. Thank you. Absolutely correct. Um, let's go to the last slide. So the question that therefore is, okay, where are we now? And this is a back and forth process with the library trustees. Uh, they met on August 21st, 2022. I believe the next day the building committee met. Our finance committee has already had an initial discussion. That brings us to today. Literally, as we began our meeting, the trustees were starting, were coming toward the end of their meeting. Uh, and then tonight we have our meeting. Our finance committee meeting tomorrow night will focus on this and hopefully by September 19th, although we begin the town council meeting at 530, it'll actually be around the um, master plan. We actually won't begin the regular town council meeting until 630. Um, with that, I'm gonna pause for questions if there are questions about what we've presented. And then we can get into other general questions. Kathy. I, I know we're gonna be taking up some of this in finance tomorrow, but I just wanna make sure if I take the slides from today and then the background information that I'll be able to track from where we were in 2021 to now um, along even soft cost lines because my memory in and I double checked it is the soft costs have furnishing in it and to get to 36 because it, it was a squeeze even to get to that amount because the, the building was supposed to originally built by forecast by 2019 but they took we took $400,000 out of furnishing so I'd like to just see what the allocation in the budget is when we see it tomorrow or at least have an explanation for and by furnishing i mean literally desks and chairs but also it um there was an, a very expensive card sorter um in the neighborhood of four hundred thousand dollars for that one so i just i just want to know what is still in the budget that we're looking at versus what's been the reconciled numbers that's one request and then the other is a question on the mou Lynn, we have it in our packet, but the, um, the agreement has a date in it that the trustees would have had to give us all of their share. And what they put up against their share was the endowment. And so they knew some money might come in later, like the historic tax credits, but we were gonna be made whole as a town um, by a certain date. And I think it was a year after final construction or a year after the date when the MS, the library, I just want to have those be clear tomorrow too. So when when we saw that large number, Sean just said, when would that have to be completed by to hold our share to the 15? And then my last question that I don't need to answer tonight is how certain is the historic tax credit? Because that's part of the um, fundraising and which libraries have received it? And were they mainly a renovation? Were any of them similar to us? I just, I know no one can say it's 100%, but are we like 60% sure? Do we have a probability on it? Because it's a, 
unusual source um, and I would love to get it. So I'm not questioning it. I just want to know what degree of certainty there is under that. Thanks. Okay. Uh, some of those questions were included in the draft questions that we have forwarded to the library, particularly the last piece with regard to the tax credits. But let me pause for a moment and ask Paul uh, if you would speak to the discussions regarding the MOU. So the um, I don't know what the library trustees were voted tonight or if they right. did vote at all. So that's a discussion I'm not alert to. But there, there would be a change to the MOU based on uh, the changing circumstances, because the MOU was written um, predicated on certain projections of, of funds. So that's something that we would be looking at um, before, you know, before we move forward, before I sign any contracts, basically. And Paul, the town council already authorized you to negotiate that MOU, and I assume that you would continue to do that. Yes. Yes. Okay. Dorothy. Uh, just a question about definitions. Um, when I look at the trustees, 5 million to 15.7 million, and uh, if that is called fundraising, and um, I am very confused at the idea that the term fundraising includes using the endowment. Uh, is that considered fundraising? The let me try to explain this as simply as I can. The trustees have engaged on a robust fundraising effort mm -hmm. in order to ensure that eventually the town would be paid. We authorized the town manager to negotiate an MOU that said, if your fundraising effort falls short, then we want you to pay us from your endowment. But the assumption all along has been that they would never touch the endowment. But if we, as a town council, vote that, then we are saying that they can and should. That they can touch the endowment? If we, if we support the idea of the MOU, then we, as a town council, are saying, although we don't want them to do it, that they are liable to do it. And if the town says we need it, they, they, we, they would do it. I mean, I just want to know what we are, are saying when we vote, when we support this. Well, first of all, the present MOU doesn't, doesn't cover the new, the new levels, okay? Mm -hmm. So then the question is, in terms of the previous MOU, what we were saying is, if you don't, if you are not able to raise the money and live up to your fundraising goals, as you have stated, then we want you to pay us at the end of a long period of time, I believe it's five years, mm -hmm. the balance from your um, um, endowment. But that means the town council is then asking for them to do that. We are asking them to make yeah. the town whole, yes. Right. So we have to decide if we want to ask that. We actually already decided that last April. Okay. Andy? Yes, I just thought it would be helpful to have a little bit of additional clarification, um, if I may. Uh, the, uh, there was a reference to Council Order FY2106C to authorize the borrowing um, and uh, of $35,279,700. That is not the town share uh, because we um, would have the responsibility as this goes forward and we'll have the responsibility if it goes forward of providing for the, uh, of uh, issuing bonds for the entire amount, but the, um, amount includes the MBLC grant and it includes the Jones Library trustee commitment. So the town share um, mm -hmm. as in the order it was actually 15751810 out of that 35 million. So it's important to recognize that um, what the town's 
share would be and um, what that order was are actually two different amounts. Right, right, right. Andy, is there anything else from the finance committee meeting that you would like to make sure people have heard? No, I think that uh, I really appreciate the summary that was given, and I think that it was very helpful. What we tried to do is for those who uh, were able to attend uh, as uh, attendees know or have watched it since, that the purpose was to understand the history, to make sure that we had opportunities for questions, and then to formulate the questions that you've seen that were posed. Um, and I, I, uh, the, uh, we didn't write a report because um, everything that was done at the meeting, there was no decision on recommendations, there were no votes of any kind, um, and uh, the work product of the committee was pr being provided to uh, all of you anyway in the packet for this council meeting. Um, either by reference um, through that um, list of things that you could uh, find by clicking on, including the order I was just referring to or otherwise. So I think that it was complete, but I just wanted to make sure that that one order, which is um, a critical piece to the understanding um, was explained. Okay, Anna. I want to be sure I'm clear here. So I'm going to say something and then I hope that people will tell me if I'm incorrect. But the trustees of the Jones Library are quite literally the trustees of their money and of their endowment and of the library. We are saying that we support their ability to bring that money, their share of it forward. If they vote to use their endowment for it, that's their prerogative. Maybe the language we should be sure to use is that that amount is the trustee's share. And I think some of some folks have been using that instead of the trustee's fundraising amount. Um, they're responsible for that amount. Ideally, that's from fundraising, but that's not the council's decision. We don't set their fundraising plan. We've authorized them. We agreed the endowment was the backstop. I believe that to vote based on how you personally believe that they should choose to spend or not spend their endowment would be misguided and inappropriate. I think that is their decision. We are here to make a different decision, not are they going to use their endowment or not. I also would note that both the town manager and the board of trustees members sign that MOU. Kathy, you asked some questions. So if you don't mind, I'm gonna to go to Jennifer next. Thank you. So um, I just want to pick up on what Andy said, just so I'm clear about. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I want to just so I'm clear about Thank this you. moving forward. So the town has, you know, we were authorized to take out a bond for the full amount of the 30.36 million dollars. So if at what point? So if it's determined that the costs have increased we would have to take out a bond for the increased cost. And would that be at the point that the bids come back or at some time prior to that? That's the first part of the question. And then I guess the second is then the town, so, so with the 36 you know, point um, to that we've already taken, that, that we've taken the bond out for, we're responsible for that full amount. And hopefully, you know, it will be reimbursed from the grant from the Board of Library Commissioners, from the fundraising, we have the CPA, and then what the town committed. So when we have to enter into an MOU for the increased cost, that's, um, the town is responsible for repaying that, no matter, is that correct? And so I guess I'm asking that question, mm -hmm. and when, at what point do we enter into a new MOU and then I guess another question might be, is that a two thirds vote of the council at that point? I'm assuming it doesn't have to go out to the voters again. So three questions, thank you. Uh, Paul, I'm gonna call on you and Sean to address the financial sequence, so, if you will, et cetera. So the MOU would be done sooner than later because if, when we're changing the MOU, you'll want to, and that be, would be a majority vote by the council. Once the bids come in and we get the firm price for what the construction project will cost, um, we will come back to the council for a, the, the additional authorization for the entire project cost. 
that's a two thirds vote to borrow the funds by, by the town council. But the earliest that vote would take place would be after we receive the construction bids. Yes, so we will know. So you're voting on something certain. So it would not be until at the earliest next summer, 2023. Can I just add one? Can I add one caveat? John, um, we, we do have to um, adhere to whatever the MBLC requires. So I think our plan is to wait till we know the exact costs um, at this time. We have reached out to the MBLC and what they've told us is um, in the past when things like this have happened, when there's been you know significant increases in costs, um, they've done it after um, there will be another cost estimate after construction documents are done. Um, before bidding, but after construction documents are done. Um, and in the past, they've seen the the town or city, whoever it was at that time, get the increased funding at that point. Um, so I think our plan is to go to bidding so we have an exact number for the council, um, but we do have to just make sure that the MBLC is, uh, su uh, allows that and is supportive of that. Sean, while we're on the issue of borrowing, am I correct that we only borrow as we need it? Yeah, so just to, so we have the 36, we actually have a 36 point something million dollar debt authorization between CPA and the general fund. They're, they were both debt authorizations. Um, the reason we did that was, A, the, the MBLC requires that you approve all eligible costs, which are a lot of the construction costs. Um, but it's also for cash flow purposes. They recommended that sometimes the MBLC grants might be delayed because of a milestone and you don't want the project to stop because of that. Um, we also did that because we know the timing of the fundraising, some of that fundraising would come in after the fact. Um, so, so we did authorize the whole amount. We will only borrow as needed, sort of taking a year look at it at a time, whatever cost we think we'll incur for that year that's how much we would borrow. So we are working with our owner project manager to update the cash flow for this project in light of the higher cost estimates. We have a good cash flow um, analysis based on the old cost estimates. Now we need to update that since we're gonna have higher construction costs. Um, and we also have to update it because now uh, the temporary borrowing we might have to do for the fundraising portion is gonna be greater. So um, the town share wouldn't necessarily increase, but the debt service costs might increase a little bit because we're gonna be doing a short-term borrowing for a larger amount. Um, so we are working with the OPM on that and we hope to have something in the next week or so. And Sean, one other question about borrowing, okay? And that is over the years, if interest rates go down, you will also refinance. Is that correct to get a lower interest rate? Yeah, so typically when you go out um, for municipal, bo municipal bonds, you can refinance after 10 years. Um, so we were thinking of a 20 year, 20 to 25 year financing for this project as it is. Um, so our, our usually our first opportunity would be after 10 years to refinance. Okay. Pam Rooney. Thanks. Um, I, think I, I think I understood Sean to say that we can't actually go out to bid until we have um, final construction documents, and I assume uh, a bond ready to go or approved for the full total project cost amount. So it's interesting because maybe the cost will come down a little bit in, in June of next year or call it nine months out. Um, but typically in construction projects, cost really don't go down. I've, I'm looking at the school where even though they worked really hard to, to trim whatever they could out of it, that amount ended up being much higher than they expected as well. Um, it seems that we, would, that we would want to understand the, the project costs a lot sooner um, and, and have a gut reaction or a, or a take by the council to see if we want to proceed with the amounts that we know will will at least be um, what we're seeing today. So, so basic question is: Aren't we required to have secured funding prior to going out to bid? So we can't really wait for the bids to come in and then say, "Oh, you know, okay, we're only going to have to bond uh, uh, X amount." Paul. So the, when they estimate construction costs, they say, when do you think you're gonna start construction? And you say, you know, November of 2023. 
then they say, okay, assuming that that's a start date, they inflate everything. So they take into account the timing of when you're going to start. They don't estimate it as if it were bid today, they estimate it on when it's going to be bid. So that's, that establishes the projected costs. I cannot sign a contract unless the funds are in place, which means the borrowing authority is in place. So that's the, you know, the council, I can't sign a contract for construction until that borrowing authorization. And that's the, the sort of key point right then. But it's, are you saying, Paul, that the borrowing authorization can come after we receive the bids, but before you sign the contract? So I, what I'm saying is I can't sign a contract unless the borrowing authorization is in place. Right. And okay. we'll we'll finalize the answer to that, Lynn. We'll, we'll reach out to the MBLC and get a definitive answer if they will um, be supportive of us waiting till that point to bring it back for a vote. Okay. Because the only reason we the only reason we wouldn't wait till that point would be as if the MBLC said we can't. Okay. Thank you, Alicia. And then I'm going back to Kathy. Um, thank you, Lynn. So my question was also about the timeline. So I think um, if what we all just talked about could be written down with even like a time frame, if there aren't exact dates, um, just so I can get an understanding of the sequence that we are trying that we are trying to follow here, because um, I'm slightly confused in the order of which we are trying to get things done. Um, so that was basically what I was going to ask for. Okay. So our is are do you feel comfortable now with this discussion on the timeline? Um, no, I would like it written down if that's possible. You would like to to have it written down because I'm still slightly confused as to what needs to happen first, then second, then third. Okay, so um, my understanding is that what has to happen first is the council. Well, the board of library trustees have been very clear that they want to continue with the project, okay? The town council needs to then look at all of the questions you've asked and the MOU that the town manager is in the process of, will be in the process of negotiating with the library and say, is that acceptable to us to go to the next step? That would happen as soon as we can make it happen, okay, this fall. If, if we could possibly do it by the 19th, I'd love to make sure we're done and we move on to our other business. We'll see if we can. Then that if we decide at that point to go forward, then the process of schematic design and construction documents happen. And then those are put out to bid. And those bids would be received sometime in the summer of 2023. And it's at that point that we have the next decision point. Based on those bids, do we continue agree to go forward or not? And if we do, then we have to authorize the new bond level. Does that help? Um, right, yes. We can write it down, but. Yes, I'm sorry, I'm writing it down as you're talking, but also, so what would be the first decision of the council would be to decide what? To decide whether or not we're willing to accept the new terms of the MOU from the, the Board of Library Trustees, I mean, I'm sorry, the Jones Library Trustees would have with the town manager. Although we have authorized him in the past to negotiate that agreement. And it was a question then, frankly, as to whether we really needed to even vote. So is that still what we're trying to decide right now? Um, I think that's part of our discussion tonight too. Okay, thank you. Um, Kathy, I've, go ahead. Okay, I'm gonna focus on the MOU. Um, mm -hmm. First of all, I wanna go back to what Anna said about the trustees are in charge of the endowment. That's clearly true. But when we agreed to this a year ago, the treasurer came to us and said, the endowment could take a risk of around $2 million without hurting its contribution to our operating budget. 
It currently contributes 12% of the library operating budget, which in our current year is $332,000. It's that's a roughly at that point, 4% draw. And when I say at that point, it depends on what the endowment level is, what the, that percent is, but the treasurer said they were comfortable, the fiduciaries were comfortable that a 4% draw was doable um, to continue. And when we agreed to take on the risk of the library, we were looking at $5.6 million of additional fundraising. And the treasurer actually came and showed us modeling of what was a higher endowment at that point, but said, you know, if the, I'll say it's 8.2 now, but if 8.2 went down to 2 million, but by 2 million went down to six, they could tolerate that for a while because the expectation is over the next couple of years, they would only be living with that shortfall or dipping into endowment for a few years. It was a very good discussion we had. And the expectation is they'd be able to get all the money and make the endowment whole so the endowment was part of the agreement, even though the trustees are indeed in charge of it. And the reason it was part of it is because it pays 12% of the operating costs. So if it goes away, we have a hole in the town's operating budget by at least $332,000. And I think the other thing that's tied to that is state money that comes in, that some of that contribution that the endowment makes is for books and supplies. So it was a package deal around this. So I just want to, I mean, there's a good, if people want to go back to the record, um, Bob Cam came in to allay our fears, those of us who are, are worried about financial risk, that we can tolerate this. This is a good bet that when we put up our endowment, we're only going to need a piece of it and not for very long. So that's number one. On number two, we voted on that MOU, Lynn. Um, I don't remember saying, here's the MOU and go ahead and change it in any way. We actually took a vote on it. And it has very specific language where the expectation is $5.6 million. So I think what, what, when Alicia is asking about this, the MOU would have to be saying that the trustees think they can raise another $10 million. Um, in addition to what they were saying they were raising before. I'm just using rough numbers. So the MOU would have to have that kind of statement. And then we would have to have a collateral that held us harmless. Um, and when I say held us harmless against financial risk, I mean both that the whole bond would have, the town share wouldn't go up, the 15.8, but also worrying about the operating budget. because. That was our understanding. I understand now that we could make a different decision, but we were voting on the basis of those the people who were the yes votes. And I believe the citizens and residents of the town were voting on a financially doable plan. That, and it, we brought in the other projects too, but this looked like a doable. It looked like we, we could do it, they could do it, um, and we thought this would all work. So I think the question of what that, if we are willing to do an MOU, it's critical that we don't just tell Paul, do whatever you feel is right. We give some explicit instructions and we see these numbers on how would the MOU change? Because I, I do not, and the reason I asked about um, books and soft costs is I'm really worried um, the Joint Capital Committee, which I'm the chair of, we saw one set of bookshelves come to us and it made sense, Anna questioned it, isn't that part of the budget? And they said, this is just temporary because the roof is leaking on special collections and we're gonna move these shelves in to where the exhibit room is and they're great shelves we're buying so we can use them in the new building. What I'm worried is that JCPC will suddenly see desks, chairs, shelves, book sorter, um, and other things coming to it over the next several years. And we're not budgeted that way. We were really budgeted with the library project giving us a new expanded, renovated, fully furnished library. So if that's the, if we're gonna be faced with that, I think we need to know it. I'm not signaling where I would go on this, but I think we need to have all the cards on the table because these aren't, I wish it was only $500,000. The numbers are so big, thanks. Okay, Dorothy. Well, the um, 
building committee has an owner's project manager. And I'm beginning to ask who is the OPM for the taxpayers of Amherst? Um, the way this is being phrased, the discussion, it's just like, it's just pulling us in, sucking us in further and further so that we have so much more sunk costs. And, you know, if you were planning a wedding, a huge wedding, and it began, the cost began to escalate as happens in real life. At some point, somebody says, listen, you've got this much money to make a wedding, do it, because we're not going to just keep going on like this. And the, the whole discussion has made me feel like we are being led further and further and further to a year from now before we make a decision. And then we're gonna be told, well, you can't go back. So I'm very unhappy about this. I, I, don't, like, I don't like the process. Now, maybe Paul is gonna make a decision soon and we won't, we'll find that we don't have to deal with it this way. I don't know. But I, I just feel like we're being pulled in. Thank you. Jennifer? Um, at the finance committee meeting last week, there was a discussion about the 1.4 or so million dollars that it would take to get to the point of issuing an RFP. And the, the question was asked, who, who pays that? And the town manager had said that would be the town. And then one of the trustees asked if the library trust the library could absorb that cost. And I realize we may, I don't know if that was something that was decided at the trustees meeting, if that even came up for vote, vote uh, today, but I'm just, so that's an, another cost that I just wanna put out on the table. And at what point are we going to discuss that? Paul, did you wanna to speak to that particular issue? I, again, I, without knowing what the trustees said today, I'd, I'd hate to sort of, speculate on what we've done. Um, you know, one of the questions was um, who takes that risk for that next $1.4 million? Mm -hmm. And the sense what, and my sense was if the trustees feel strongly enough about the project that they would backstop that decision, those two contracts with the, with the endowment, and that would get us to construction bid documents. But this is what part of what would be covered in an MOU amendment. Exactly, exactly, yeah. Okay. then that MOU would come to us. I mean, will the council be able to weigh in on that next and that next cost? I, I would certainly review that with the town council for sure. Mandy Jo. So I don't think we should forget. I think we should keep in mind that 65% of the residents supported this project. And while we have some estimates that the costs have increased, getting us to bid, given what the town manager just said about potentially the trustees' willingness to backstop the cost between now and bid, means that until we see actual bids, the risk to the trustees, the risk to the town, nothing has changed. We need to modify an MOU to make that happen. Uh, that's the manager's prerogative to do that. I certainly support the modification of an MOU. Um, we didn't vote the language of the last MOU. I don't see why we'd need to vote the language of this MOU. That's the manager signs the MOUs. He's the executive, not us. Um, you know, we can move forward and we should move forward to those bids because the residents support it. And as I just said, the new MOU keeps the town whole at least until bid time, as long as we can negotiate that. And it does, doesn't risk any more endowment than as Kathy just said was previously thought with the MOU. Given those circumstances, a temp, what you could think of as a sort of a temporary MOU to get us to that point when we truly know the actual costs. I mean, the current estimate builds in 1% cost escalation a month. If that, that's already slowing down, that will bring the cost down, even though costs, as Pam said, always go up in construction. But if we've estimated the cost escalation too high, the new cost and the bid would be lower. Um, we, don't, we shouldn't stop now. We need to keep going. We need to get to that actual number at that bid. And if we're not going to, as a town, risk any additional money because the trustees are willing to backstop the costs to get to that bid, 
at no more than what they were putting at risk originally in their um, endowment, we should do it and we should just move on and move as quickly as possible so that we can get this project going. Michelle? Um, yeah, I'm, I guess I'm feeling a little bit of frustration. I did attend the trustee meeting tonight. And so I'm feeling like there are several pieces of information that became available in that meeting. Um, and here we're talking about this without having those pieces of information available to us. Um, and I understand that the timing was very, very tight. Um, but what I would ask is that the chair of our finance committee and uh, the chair or someone else of the trustees have a conversation, if possible, before our finance committee meeting tomorrow. Um, because if we're going to be asked to make a recommendation at the finance committee meeting without having that information that was uh, outlined in tonight's trustee meeting, I, I just think that we're wasting our time. And so I, I really hope that um, I'm not going to try to go through everything that was agreed upon in that meeting tonight by any means, um, but there are really important nuggets of information that would, I think, help us <laughs> uh, move this forward. So that's one comment. And then the other comment that I have is um, looking at the MOU, it looks like it deals with lack of fundraising. So if there's not enough money raised, um, but it doesn't look like it deals with cost escalation. So I'm wondering if the town manager has had any conversations um, with our legal counsel about what basically, what I heard Mandy just say is that we are not responsible for the language in the MOU and that, um, there's nothing that we're on the hook for really with respect to what's in the MOU. And, but it doesn't take into account um, this cost escalation issue that we're dealing with. And so I'm just wondering if there's been any legal uh, discussion, um, Town Manager Bachelman, that you've had uh, that would give us better direction to, um, as counselors. Thank you, Paul. So, so the town attorney did does review the MOU before I sign it. Obviously, that that's a, something I consult with them on. In terms of the escalation, as I mentioned before, the cost escalations should be built in. You know, when they they estimate the costs, they say when do you think you're going to begin construction, and then they estimate what they think construction inflation is going to look like over. The, say you're going to say I'm going to start in a year. They they estimate what that cost is going to look like in a year from now. And at the time they did the bid, they did the quote, the estimation, um, there was hyperinflation in the construction industry that has since tampered, temp, tamped down a little bit. So it could, if they, whenever you make cost estimates, you take a point in time and you say, this is our best guess and you're gonna build in 2023, this is what we think it's going to cost. So they build in that cost escalation there. It could be more, it could be less. We don't know, it's just an estimate until we actually go out to bid and there are contractors who look at the project, look at bid documents, look at the um, design and then put their numbers on a piece of paper and give it to us in a sealed envelope. We won't know what the actual cost is, but we have, we, we, we hired just like, um, we've been doing this in a really thoughtful way. We had two estimators look at the design and come, to, and come up with separate um, estimates. And then we had them sit down together and sort of paw through them and come up with a compromise between and there were a couple million dollars off from each other, but they were in the same ballpark. So that's how we come to the estimate. What do we think the cost is going to be? So we have people there, there are people in the field, construction experts who make these cost estimates for a living. Uh, and they, they know the industry, they know the supply chain issues and things like that. So hopefully they're, they're pretty accurate in their projections. Michelle, did that answer your question for the moment? I mean, uh, it, does, it doesn't I have, take away the frustration that we had simultaneous meetings going on. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess I just have a follow-up. I just, I have a feeling that 
it may come down to uh, disagreement among the counselors on whether the MOU, the next MOU, is our responsibility to guide or not. And what I'm saying is I would like to know if there's anything in terms of my responsibility as a counselor that the MOU dictates I should be concerned with. Um, and, and that's important for me to understand that. Um, because a lot of this, like when, when you're talking about bonds and, and this and that, like, I think we're all trying to follow along as best we can, but at the end of the day, what's going to happen if the library isn't able to raise that money? And is the M MOU important for us to be evaluating now? Or as Mandy said, let's get us to that bid place um, and then make a decision and whatever else needs to be agreed upon in the interim, like who's paying to get us to bid can be agreed upon. And, and so that's that's kind of where, where I'm at right now. Thank you. Yeah, I, if, if we could, if this was a crystal ball, <laughs> it's not. And that's part of the problem. Andy? Do you want to go to the others who, uh, who haven't uh, asked questions sure. yet? Sure. Uh, Shalini? Um, yeah, I was wondering if it would be helpful to hear from the library trustees today about the MOU, because I did also attend, but I don't know if everyone got a chance to attend. That's I attended as well, although I had to stop attending because of this meeting. And unfortunately, I think it's best if those things are done as formal communications. Okay. And we did not, um, there are several trustees in the room but that wasn't set up that way. Okay. The finance so then, committee yeah. can hear from them tomorrow. Okay, so tomorrow we can tune into that. Um, what I wanted to say was, you know, like as I was thinking through this whole process and I'm like, okay, this is a really risky decision for the town. It entails millions of dollars as everyone has talked about. But along with that, two other things that come to my mind that I wanted to share. One is the way the current uh, Massachusetts Board of Library Commissioners process is set up. As was shared, we started the process in 2013 when the cost estimates and along with inflation and all of that was done at some point. And now we're in 2022 when, so anything can happen in between, including pandemics. And so there is going to be that, that failure of and those risks that are going to happen even if we don't move ahead now and say okay let's back off and let's start again you know the, it's we're going to still be in the same position because we're going to go down the road and we'll start all over again and we can see from the schools which could have been done in 2017 for 67 million dollars and today we're talking about more than 100 million so just because we backed away from that very important decision we are now going to be spending, the town is spending $33 million more because they waited for a better solution. So all I'm saying is just let's keep in mind that this system is not going to change. We're still going to be back in the same situation if we don't move forward. The second thing that comes to my mind is what is the alternative? And the alternative is that the uh, the cost of repairs have also gone up. The alternative is we return the one million along with the interest, and the costs which have gone up are what like sixteen to nineteen and a half million dollars. Whereas that also then that's going to be the town bearing all of that cost. And so, meanwhile, we do have a really good comp a very experienced team of fundraisers who without even really starting have collected or have raised institutional money of a million, 1.3 million. They've got 1.79 million pledged from individuals. They have people at the state level with grants and so forth. I just wanna say there's a whole fundraising plan with very experienced people willing to do this and the is are willing to with the MOU change terms that will save confidence and we want to move forward. 
So given that the case, what is the, you know, looking at the alternative with going back and then spending all this 16 to 19 million dollars in an open that's not going to be environmentally friendly, that's not going to offer the programs that are new building for community building, for youth, for teens, for BIPOC, all of the work that the trustees are doing in a very systematic manner, all of that is going to be shelved. So I just want us all to keep all you know, the alternatives in mind as well as we move forward. Shalini, thank you for that. Uh, be, and I just want to pause and just say, they could, we could turn back on this grant. From everything we can understand, MBLC is ready to start a new competition round. And they already have 40 other libraries who've said they'd like to be in that round. Um, the second thing is, even if we don't do this, we're still gonna to have to repair the existing library. And we have an estimate for repair, not remodel, not renovate, repair. And those costs have gone up too. So there, there is no good solution here. There is not a good solution. Just, but Shalini, you began to lay out the alternatives and those alternatives each play against each other. Pat, DeAngelis, you've not spoken. Thank you. Um, I don't know where I'm coming down on this. Really, honestly, I'm listening to uh, people here in the council. I've been listening to residents. Um, and the one thing I know is that the public library was an incredibly important um, as asset in my growing up. But I'm really trying to understand what's at risk here. Um, and I'm not sure that I completely agree that it's it's uh, quite as simple as it's been laid out. Um, we have, really do have to consider what we're moving forward with. What's the impact of these increases for the library on the other building projects? I mean, when when uh, Sean Magano um, uh, made his um, budget information available to us for, you know, he did the modeling. Uh, we noticed how tightly things were going. So these increases in, uh, in costs affect the DPW and they affect the uh, renovation of the firehouse. They affect who pays for the uh, budget for the library. And my concern is that we're looking at our workers and doing locking ourselves into a grandiose library and not paying any attention to what we need to do for DPW and fire. We can say that we will now, but there is minimal money and it has been consistent policy of previous um, uh, select boards and town meetings and, and town managers to avoid maintaining things because in the future we're going to be doing this building. So I am really concerned about how we make this decision and what what we base it on. Um, and I'm concerned, no, I don't I can't tell the trustees what to do. But no, neither do I want to be locked into a position of paying more to operate the library because they failed to do what they said they're gonna do. So there's not a simple solution. And um, I honestly still don't know where I will fall down on this decision or fall up to this decision. Anika, you've not spoken. Sorry, I was stuck on mute. Um, yeah, so I appreciate all of the uh, comments that have been made um, and they're across the board. So I'm hopeful that we'll move to a space of bottom line. So we have facts to you know, really focus on what can be done um, to create the most good for the most people um, with this and, and all projects. Um, I think that you know, there are clearly efforts in the, in the works that we would know how they could pan out and how they would affect this project, others in town uh, before 
we would have to make a decision, e even including us being clear. We're having, you know, some counselors were questioning, do we, can we tell um, the trustees what to do or what that? So it just, even within this discussion, it's, it's, um, it seems clear that there are still a lot of facts and, and bottom lines and even some, you know, both hard and soft costs that would need to be learned um, before we can make a decision that is really based on making the best decision for the residents of the town and taking out just a little bit of our uh, personal opinions on what is um, what seems financially responsible or not at this point. Okay, um, I'm gonna go back now to Andy. Yeah, I've been taking notes as questions have come along and some of them have been responded to. So I uh, certainly am gonna try and bear that in mind as I go through, for example, references made to the repair cost. One of the things that was not mentioned earlier uh, was that the first council that made the decision was looking at the repair costs and was recognizing that 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 $15 million town share was pretty much equal to the amount that was being uh, calculated by Coon Riddle is the likely amount. And as Lynn said, both amounts were subject to increase since then. So that uh, if we don't go forward with library, uh, the, uh, it falls back on the um, capital planning process um, to um, for the repairs. And um, having been on JCPC for a number of those years when uh, the library was being discussed for repair costs, uh, you know, a decision was made and I, I stand by that decision. Some people have criticized it, but I stand by it that we didn't want to invest money that was going to then uh, be um, sort of more logically a part of a uh, renovation and expansion project that it was not wise that unless it was really um, something that was um, essential to the safety and well-being of the library itself that it was not wise to do but we are gonna to have to deal with that repair cost if we don't go forward. So to think that we're getting out of a responsibility to the library of you know, 15 plus million dollars, I think that's not likely. Um, the point was made about the endowment decision belonging to the trustees and it does. Um, the question came up about operating expenses. I think that that's a very important question. That was on the question list that we posed to the library because, and we're hoping for a response to that tomorrow at the uh, committee meeting, because it is important to know if we go <clears throat> forward with the model of um, being willing to commit the entire endowment for this, then what happens to the operating costs? Because in the end, um, the traditional approach that the town has taken towards operating budget increases is, is to try and make all of them equal. And there have been rare exceptions to that. And uh, so we're really looking to the library to explain how it is going to absorb those differences. And that's um, really something I'm looking forward to tomorrow. Um, I think that somebody else made the kind of comment that I was thinking about, which is um, I'm not prepared to guess on the intent of voters. You know, we know that almost two thirds voted one way. Uh, we don't know how people would vote under different circumstances or what drove that vote. Um, but it was a very strong vote. Um, the uh, you know, question has been made about um, the trustees meeting today. I uh, will send something out tonight to uh, several trustees and to the library director requesting that um, they make a report tomorrow at the finance committee meeting. And I guess the last thing that I wanted to just um, 
conclude with is, you know, a lot of this I feel is a problem that we're having because of the Mass Board of Library Commissioners. And um, there's sort of two different things. One is, is that uh, they have defined what they think needs to be the scope of the library and um, are not allowing us to have a free um, will of, or, or be free to make significant changes in um, the size of the building of the program. And um, the other is that the MBLC um, committed an amount of money. We envisioned an amount of money. And then there was this huge increase in construction costs and MBLC has so far taken the position that the increase in construction costs is our problem, not their problem. Um, and uh, that I think is a uh, major, major issue and one that I think that we need to be raising. And I think that we actually are raising in different circles to try and um, address that issue. But um, I did want to at least point that out. And if I could take a moment, let me talk about the conversations that I'm aware of with the MBLC. Uh, and that is that uh, Senator Comerford and Representative Dom have been extremely interested in this. They have held a meeting with um, library, um, with the library director. I was invited to that meeting last week. It was to begin to try to form a coalition with the other towns that are in the same situation we are with the goal of trying to get the legislature to increase their appropriation to MBLC uh, in order to give each of the projects more money to at least come up to the percentage that they originally were going to support. There's a lot of ifs in that. And uh, the present up possible vehicle for that would be the supplemental, which is being worked on right now, but that might not happen. It might happen. Um, but if it does happen, uh, then MBLC, of course, has to agree to all that. There's layers and layers be around an effort like I've just described, um, but the effort's being made. And three of the libraries affected are in fact in Joe Comerford's district. So I think there's a total of 14 and three are in her district. So yeah. it's um, there's it's not to say we're not trying, it's just that there's no guarantee um, to try to get MBLC to step to the plate with more money because it means the legislature would have to, yes. Yeah, um, just so you know too, that um, I think most people are aware that I'm on the, Massachusetts Municipal Association Financial Policy Committee. And uh, I have been raising this issue since uh, probably June on, on regarding MBLC and uh, Mass School Building Authority. And uh, I have been getting support from other members of the committee because there are um, representatives of other cities and towns statewide who, as soon as I raised the issue, said, yeah, us too. Um, and I ex um, I'm hopeful that we can make some progress on uh, getting um, some, some major support out of the MMA um, this fall. I can't guarantee it, but I can assure you that I'm working on it. Great, thank you. Alicia, I think everybody's spoken ask questions at least once. So I'm gonna just start back around. Alicia. Thank you, Lynn. Um, so I'm just thinking about like the timeline of the process and saying that I know we started this a long time ago. Um, some of the things that are still unclear to me is why we would not think that there's a possibility of a project increase still when we have gotten previous cost estimates that have then increased. For example, we voted on a certain number just last year that has increased. And so what is the difference between those cost estimates and the one that we have now that we are expecting not to have an increase? Um, so that's one of the things that is unclear to me. Um, 
And also if there is actually a such thing as a temporary MOU or if that was just a figure of speech. Um, so some of those things are slightly confusing to me, but I think that we've talked about a lot of things, but I think that in reality, the framing of this conversation should be more shifted to like the total cost project. Um, because I think that is what the risk that we are looking at right now is with the total project cost and thinking that if we are making financially responsible decisions for the town that will still allow us to achieve other goals and other projects that we have going at the same time. Um, and so my concerns are still um, not with just the cost of this project, like in a vacuum, but the cost of this project in relation to other projects and other things that we need to get done for the town. Um, and thinking back to the presentation that Sean gave us a few months ago on the four capital projects. And like Pat said, seeing how close those numbers are and how we talked about how tight the budgets will be and how increasingly tighter they will become, which, will, which we talked about being worried about the firefighter positions that are being funded by ARPA money. And we talked about being worried about uh, money for Crest if it needs to be increasing that budget in the years to come and not being certain that those things can be covered, but then making other large financial decisions in spite of those things and having uncertainty there. I'm not sure if that is a fin financially responsible uh, position to be in. And so I think that is the question now is if this is a financially responsible decision as a whole project cost. So I think like the conversation has shifted from what we were talking about before, because we know that there was a majority of people who wanted this project to move forward. We know that because we had a vote. So I don't think that is in question anymore. Um, I think the question now is, is this for us as town councilors a responsible decision that we will be making on behalf of the residents in our town? Um, and so I think it would be helpful to talk about it that way because it's very confusing when we talk, when we frame it in other ways and to be sure that we're making the best decision. Um, and so I think some of the other things, and I know that some of these might come up at tomorrow's um, finance committee meeting, which is also why it's hard, like having all these different meetings, like Michelle um, and Anika said, having the trustee meeting before and having all these different important pieces of information that don't get all put together at the same time, but we're still making really important decisions makes it very difficult. But one of the questions that I think will be really important for me to know is that if um, like the worst case scenario, because I think when we're assessing risk, we have to think about if the worst thing happened and how that would affect us so that we can be prepared. And so in the worst case scenario that the trustees are unable to meet their fundraising expectations and the endowment is used, how that will then affect our operating budget for our town moving forward. And if that is something we can sustain and still cover things like the four firefighter position, positions that are going to be not on ARPA in the years to come. And um, the ex possible expansion of CRESS or possible money for the resident oversight board or whatever other projects that we have in the pipeline. And so I think that it will be really important for me to know how those things directly affect our operating budget moving forward. And so that I can know exactly what is on the line with the risk that we are taking, because this is a very big risk. Okay. Um, Jennifer. Yes, I, I'm concerned. I get when I hear that the train has left the station and it's too late to pull back. I just think that's not a helpful way to frame the conversation. And I think as good stewards of the public money, that that's, I, I would like to, um, you know, refrain from that because we do have choices. And I guess some of I'm echoing uh, what Pat and Alicia expressed very well, but we, we do have other choices. If it looks like the library where we initially thought it was gonna be 36 million and now it's more like 50 million, we don't have to say, well, it's just gonna keep escalating. So we just, this prices could keep escalating. Um, again, the train hasn't left the station. We, we can pivot mm -hmm. um, and repair costs have no doubt increased, but I still think, and I'm not advocating for this. I'm just saying that I think, a you know, if we were to look at 
you know, something like repair and renovation. Costs have increased since 2013, 2017, and even 2021, but they're probably not in the $50 million range. Um, and I would, yes, very much if, if we, if the, if we go ahead and the cost of the library is significantly higher as what the projections are, which is why we're having this conversation now, if they weren't, things would just continue, uh, you know, at, according to plan and it wouldn't have come back to the council. But um, if we, we need to know that if we increase the town's contribution beyond the 15 or so million dollars, how that will impact the other capital projects. Because I do think when the voters went to vote, they voted on the $36 million and the 15.8 from the town. And they may not feel comfortable with us, you know, committing five to 10 or more million dollars that take away from other capital projects. Um, and I would, um, I'm concerned that if we don't, so if the, if down the road, we don't increase the town's contribution and we're putting perhaps another $10 million on the library trustees to raise in addition to the almost $6 million they've committed to, that makes that, I think that's an unreasonable um, ask and expectation. So, um, and I am, would be hopeful that the uh, Board of Library Commissioners you know, might um, increase that the amount that they are going to give to the other towns in the consortium that are approaching them through our state representatives. But if, you know, from what I understand, there's like eight to 13 towns in a situation similar to ours. So that's a lot of money being asked from the Board of Library Commissioners. So I would wonder if they increase it, how much it, it will dent the whole so those are my questions and my concerns. Thank you. I only want to add one qualification. There is at this time no discussion on the table about us increasing our share. Okay. And that, that's why my concern is about asking the trustees to maybe raise $15 million. I, under, I understand that relationship, but there there is no discussion on the table about us increasing our share at this time. Thank you. Okay. Pam. Thanks. So um, even at the time that the town allocated or, or approved the 15.8 million for the bond, that was a, as I understand it, it was sort of a maximum that they found acceptable, that the council found acceptable in light of exactly what has just been said, in light of the other four projects that, that are the other three projects that are all tightly in sync with each other. The information that Kathy Shane brought up about the operating budget for the library and that that was also very carefully constructed to not exceed their, their tipping point or their, their weak, weakness, I'll just use that word, um, that was a really very interesting and important factor for me because it means that in fact, what was just said there are, there are very likely going to be uh, ramifications for operating budgets down the, down the road. Of those four projects, when they started, the, the school building was, was thought to be a certain price and it is clearly shown to be a much higher price than, than originally expected. That is one of the four projects that is in fact the most project, the most important project that we are currently needing and, and, and desiring. Um, I don't wanna see anything happen that would jeopardize the ability for the town to borrow money uh, with, a, with, a, with an override um, to make that project happen. So um, someone brought up earlier uh, the idea of alternatives. Alternatives are a very real option. Um, we have, we have cost of doing business between now and going out to bid of 1.4 million, whatever we have nine months of time, which is roughly the time that would go from uh, conceptual design through uh, schematic or schematic to through conceptual and design development documents to get those construction bid documents ready. And um, we have nine months that in fact could be spent looking at if it were the will of the council 
and maybe the trustees to in fact, go back to that repair renovation and ADA uh, improvement scenario. And in fact, have a very solid building that is functional for the next several generations, um, more in line with 20 to $25 million. And I would just put that out there. Uh, Sean, you had your hand up. Yeah, I just want to clarify because I've heard it a couple of times. Um, we're wrapping up schematic design at this point and the phases we're heading into our design development and construction documents and then eventually bidding. Um, but we've been in schematic design and we're at the end of that phase. Thank you. Uh, Dorothy. Okay, a, a comment and a question and I'll be quick. Um, I agree that there is no discussion on the table about the town increasing our share, but if in fact the endowment is used, then we are, because then there will be no money there for the operating expenses. But my question is, and, and I'm, I'm sure you've already answered this, but this gets so confusing. We had a vote and the public went to vote and it was very clear what they voted on. And there were numbers in that vote as to how many dollars here, how many dollars there. Will the public be asked to vote with the new numbers? Because it's a very different issue now. We're not talking the numbers. What the public supported is not what people are talking about now. They're talking about way more money. So will there be another vote for the public? That's my question. The, the vote that was held the last time was in response to a request, a petition, if you will, for a vote. And even then that wasn't required. So it, we did not we did not have to go out to vote. We chose to go out to vote. Okay. So then there's no guarantee that the public will be given these new numbers and asked to weigh in on spending them. The Is that council right? would have to decide to go out to vote. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Shalini? Uh, I think there's a very important difference <clears throat> between DPW fire and school project and the li versus the library. In a good way, the library, the increase, for the increase, we have the library trustees, we have people who are fundraising, and the additional cost is not coming to us. I mean, we are in a very lucky situation that we have board of trustees who are so committed and we have and they have an excellent team of fundraisers who are doing so we have partners we're not alone in this process i think we're in a position as well as we could given the way the mblc system works we are really positioned in a good place it's not a good situation i agree but like i said the alternatives are bad and i also want to just remind people that when hitchcock center raised $6 million in 2015. How many people even know about Hitchcock Center and their cause was building a living building? Yeah, I definitely care about it, but they raised that money. We have to give people who do this job for a living, give them a chance to do what they do. We have people in our town who have already committed one point, I don't know how many million, and institutional money. And at the state level, we, we have grants. There's ARPA money right now that could be utilized. We have all these different sources. We have partners in town. We have residents who are so committed to this project. And none of it is coming right at this point. We, the town is not being asked to take on the additional burden of the capital. So, I don't know. We'll, I, I do want to see the MOU and the discussion that happens um, to give us as a council the assurance that um, coming from the trustees that the town is not going to be liable. Okay. I'm going to take two more comments and then just remind us we're not coming to a vote tonight. Uh, the uh, We will have more information by next week and the finance committee is meeting tomorrow. Uh, Anna? I hope I earn my spot as one of your last two comments here. So the deja vu is, is so real today, and I wasn't even at this table last time that uh, this was all coming up. So I'm having a lot of deja vu, which is very strange for me. But 
When we consider financially responsible decision-making, we once again need to remember that regardless, we're spending money on this library. The current conditions are not acceptable. We cannot keep the current conditions. Not spending money is not an option, right? We know that from the entire first debate on this. Uh, the library, given the fact that with the updated modelings, the town's contribution does not change, given that the trustees are capable of making informed decisions and understand their financial responsibility to the town with regards to their operating budget. Is it responsible to do what I think is being softball pitched out here and, and turn down 13 point X million from MBLC? That money can't go to anything else. It can't go to schools. It can't go to Crest. It can't go to anything else, right? That's money that we would say no to. Um, I do not believe the trustees would vote to pledge their endowment without considering their operating budget commitments to the town. I also wanna follow up on my comment from finance. We need to support the trustees in seeking state and federal funds. I do not believe in having spoken to other folks who are engaged in those spaces, am confident that the library project is different enough from other capital needs. So seeking state and federal funds for the library would not be double dipping and removing that from the schools. We can still seek that in the future. I believe that we as a council need to send a strong statement along with Rep Dom and Senator Comerford that the MBLC should not be accepting new projects until, the, until they are able to see the projects that they have committed to through to fruition. We need to be working together as a council with the other libraries that, have ex, that were brought into the MBLC program and strongly advocating for them to either proportionately increase the funds that they've allocated bring us up to the same dollar amount that we were we were able to contribute last time. These are the kind of the three options in my mind. Uh, bring us up to the same dollar amount that we were going to have to contribute between the trustees and the town last time, the same bond amount, or allow projects to adapt their designs. Those are the three ways that we. I think all of the towns need to come together on this, but our advocacy needs to be very strong. And that's what I'd like to see us discussing is what are we gonna put in a letter? How are we gonna coordinate with these other groups? Um, because that's what needs to shift here. The MBLC, need, MBLC needs to move in our direction, to be clear. Thanks. Mandy Joe. I agree with everything Anna just said. Um, <laughs> um, but I, I do wanna respond to um, Pam's comments, which is I disagree that we should even be considering pulling the plug right now. We shouldn't um, because we need to find out what the real number is. We need to get to bid documents to find out what the real number is. Um, you know, if, if we don't do that, we turn down the money, we have to repair a building. You, Pam, just even estimated that those repair costs would be 20 to 25 million. We're trying to find a an expansion cost at 15 million. And you just said, well, maybe we should throw in 20 million to repair a building, but we can't find 20 million to, you know, it, no, no, I, you didn't say that. I, I know you didn't, but you implied that maybe the repair cost would be up to 20 or 25 million and we could do that. But we're here struggling to say, but should we pull a project now when it still at this point would only cost us 16 million? We know the repair costs are above that right now. Um, we need to give this project and the trustees a chance to show us that it really will only cost us 16 million to see this project to fruition. And if we get to bid and we haven't seen that from the trustees and the number is higher and they're seeking, which right now they are not, seeking more money than 16 million from us, then we can have that conversation as to whether increasing our contribution above 16 million makes sense financially, fiscally sense, or whether we move and turn down the state money, turn down all of that excellent fundraising that is going on and say, we're just gonna go on our own and repair this building. And yeah, it might cost 20 million, but we'd rather repair for 20 million than spend 15 or 18 million to do a new project. That's when we can have that conversation. Having that now when we don't know the numbers, I think is fiscally irresponsible. Let's go forward, get to the bid projects, and see what those numbers are. And let us not forget that if we turn down this money, that repair number does not include any energy efficiency climate action changes. We would be installing a new HVAC system that uses oil under the repair costs. If we would want to change that, those numbers that we have for repair 
would go up because those repair numbers are only for an oil system. And so don't lose our climate action goals in this debate here well before we even need to have the debate as to how much money we as a town should be putting in, if any, beyond the money that we've already contributed. Let the trustees, let the, the fantastic fundraising team that is out there lobbying do their work, give them the confidence we're, that we're gonna let them do that for the next nearly a year and see where we are then, see where the inflations are, see where the actual bids are. That's the fiscally responsible thing to do right now. Pam, I was going to say that was the last comment, but you have your hand up. That's, that's true because notice that I did not use the, the numbers 16 to 19 million for repairs and renovations uh, and ADA improvements. I used 20 to 25 which would then of course look at some of the energy improvements and, and perhaps even some space planning that could reshape some of the, some of the usable spaces in the library. And recognizing that the 15-8 that the town committed to would then be added to, or would then get the $1 million of CPAC money, plus the $2 million that the, that the library trustees is comfortable, you know, using of their, of their uh, endowment without harming the towns, et cetera, et cetera. So you're very close. You, in fact, are almost there with your fundraising already in place. Thank you. All right. I believe we've taken this conversation as far as we can, uh, and we'll be returning to it on the 19th, hopefully with a whole lot more information. And uh, with that, I am going to uh, suggest that we take a break. Uh, let's do five minutes and be back and continue at that point. Please turn your mics off as well as your picture. I forgot a night here. How long is the break? Ah, 8.20, thank you.
as you return, please turn your uh, picture back on so I know you're here. As you return, please turn your picture back on so I know you're here. Athena, we are going to be bringing two people in to make public, to make comment. They're the petitioners, okay? Please turn your picture back on when you return. Pam. All right, we're going to continue. Uh, our, again, there is a change in the order, order of the agenda. We are going to take up action item B, and then we will go back to A. Action item B is a um, petition for what has been a private road to be our private roads to be brought into the public way. This is something that this council nor the previous council has ever dealt with. And so I wanted to make sure as we start into this, we have good background. And I'm gonna start by calling on Paul Bachman. And then we have Christine Brestrup, our planning director and our town engineer, Jason, Jason Skeels with us tonight. We also have two of the petitioners, one is Douglas Donnell, president of Meadows Homeowners Association, and Connie Kruger, who swore she'd never come to one of these meetings. <laughs> Former select board, but also a resident of this area. So Connie, welcome back. Um, okay, Paul. Thank you, Lynn. So as you mentioned, we, this is the first time we're doing a road acceptance in this way. So I think we want, as you said, take our steps carefully and make sure all of our bases are covered. This is your introductory meeting. We're gonna ask you to refer it to the planning board and to the finance committee or whatever other committees you choose on the town council to refer it to. We'll give you a little bit of background. Um, the uh, proponents, you know, Doug and Connie can speak to their request. They're the ones who initiated this request by writing a letter to the, to the council. Uh, and then we'll go from there. So Chris. Great, Chris. Good evening. I'm Chris Brestrup, Planning Director. Hello, everybody. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little about the project. We have um, written a memo to you. Paul Bachelman sent you a memo, which outlines a lot of these things, but I'll just go over them briefly. Um, the Town Council has been asked to accept as public ways the subdivision roadways that were part of the, meadow, the Meadows subdivision. And the Meadows is a neighborhood um, located off Old Farms Road in the Amherst Field section of Amherst. I would call it East Amherst, and I live in East Amherst. Um, Hopbrook Road and Kestrel Lane are the two roadways in question that the town council is being asked to accept. Um, these roadways are shown on a definitive subdivision plan that was approved by the planning board in 1995. And you've received copies of the plans for this um, subdivision. I think there are four of them all together. They should be in your packet. The subdivision was begun by Jeffrey Flower in the late 1990s, and it was purchased by Doug Cole of Tofino Associates and Cole Construction sometime after that. Um, the roadways were constructed in the early 2000s, and they were substantially completed by about 2004. 
but there were punch list items that remained to be completed. Over the intervening years, the roadways have deteriorated. Um, town Council may wish to seek a report from the Superintendent of Public Works and the Town Engineer, and also their recommendation on several items. One being the status of the listed punch list items that have been completed to the satisfaction of the DPW. Two is a report on the current condition of the road and if there are any other items that need to be addressed. Three is an estimation of whether and when the roads will like, likely need to be resurfaced. And four is a recommendation on the acceptance of the roads as public ways. T the town's attorneys, KP Law, prepared a memorandum to help cities and towns to create a public way. And you have a copy of this memorandum in your packet. They've outlined three steps to be taken, and the steps include the layout process, the acceptance, and the acquisition of interests in the land. At this time, the town council is being asked to conduct the layout process. And the steps in the layout process are as follows. First, there's a petition to lay out the road as a public road. And we have, you have received the petition from the Meadows Homeowners Association. Association sorry. Second is the layout plan and or description. So you're required to have either a plan or a, a description in words of the land that you're being asked to accept. And in this case, you have the definitive subdivision plan dated 1995, and that has been submitted to town council. The third thing um, that you need to do is a referral to the planning board. And as part of the referral to the planning board, the town council needs to vote to, um, to vote its intention to lay out the ways as public ways, and then refer the plan to the planning board for a recommendation. And the planning board then has 45 days to submit a non-binding report to the council. And after that, there's a layout meeting where the town council then needs to vote to adopt the layout as it's shown on the layout plan. After they're finished, after you, you are finished with the layout process, um, then the town council needs to vote to accept the ways by a majority vote. And once you have accepted the ways, you need to acquire an interest in the land. And we're going to be seeking um, guidance from KP Law as to uh, the form of um, interest that you will be asked to accept in the land. Um, so these are essential steps that were outlined in the memorandum, and I'm happy to answer questions. Chris, first of all, thank you I, for both the memos and your work on this and that very straightforward explanation. Dorothy. Um, after I went to the transfer station uh, a few days ago, I, I drove around the roads and uh, I was trying to figure out, are we, you know, accepting roads that exist or making new roads? And so it's the documents that have come since. It's the idea that the town would be accepting these existing roads as one that the town would be responsible for plowing and paving. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Well, it seemed it, it seemed reasonable to me. That's all I'll say. Thank you. Kathy. Um, just building on Dorothy's, if I'd like to know what benefit it would be to the town to accept the roads. So I can understand the benefit and the switch that we might, we would be plowing them, repairing them in the future. So I just, I'd like that laid out to us on why we might want to do this. Um, secondly, um, the memo that was carefully written has a lot of mays in it. We may do this and may do that. One of them was find out what the current condition of the roads are. Do they need to be repaired or not? And I think it would be hard to make a decision on this till we did do that. So I would wanna change that to, we will ask for that. I'd like to know whether the roads need to be repaired, how, how soon would they need to be resurfaced? Are there other issues? I saw the punch list that are, and, and Guilford's comment in this, there might have been others. Um, so I know we're gonna hear from Jason. So my first is why might we want to do this? What, what benefit would there be to the town? 
and then what are the current conditions? Because um, I understand we take over, I guess now they're plowed by private plows. We don't have to plow those roads um, or, or we plow them now. So Connie's saying, no, we plow them now. So I just wanna know what we take on when we take on the roads. And I think then it's the repair and maintenance of the roads. So just, it would, I would like it a little bit clearer on what we gain by it and to what extent we're taking on expenses. And Chris, you have your hand up, so I'm going to call on you. I just wanted to share a few thoughts about um, those questions and um, what benefit is it to the town? Well, I think the benefit is to be assured that those roads are passable, passable for emergency vehicles and passable for school buses. Um, if the roads are allowed to deteriorate, if the um, you know neighborhood association or the developer or some private entity is in charge of um, making sure that the roads are passable, we run the risk of not having them be passable. And so, um, you know, if you want to make sure that the buses and the ambulances can get to the people who live there, I would say that that is a benefit to the town. In terms of um, what the current condition of the roads is, I think that um, Jason Skills, the town engineer, would be better able to answer that question. Jason, do you want to chime in on that at this time? Benefit. We need to hear, uh, Jason, you need to unmute or something. Can you hear me? Turn your sound up, maybe? It's not loud enough, Jason. Yeah, I think you need to turn your sound up. Thank you. All right, sorry. Um, where to find that? Okay. Um, what if I lean in? Can you hear me now? That's better. We still can't hear you. Um, if you go down along your bottom of your computer, I don't know what kind of computer you're using, and look for the little megaphone. Okay, here we go. And go to it and move it so that we can hear you. Don't have a megaphone. Let me come back to Jason. Uh, Mandy Joe, go ahead with your questions. And then I also want to give uh, Doug, Douglas Donnell and Connie a comment, an uh, opportunity to comment, because they may have some additional benefits that they would list as well. Yeah, Mandy Joe? I don't expect any answers to these questions tonight, but I'm putting them out there for Finance Committee in particular. Um, I was wondering, the, the plans right now show that there should be sewer and maintenance easements. And so my question is, do the, does the town already have those sewer and maintenance easements that are listed on that subdivision definitive plan? Or would those are those also being asked to be adopted now or obtained now? Who technically owns what would become the public way? Um, is it each homeowner, the HOA, the developer? The memo we got from KP Law indicates that we might need legal agreements with all the homeowners, even if the HOA or developer kept the ownership fee in the deeds. And so we should investigate how onerous all of that would be. Um, a question about why it's taken 20 to 25 years to ask for the acceptance. Um, that seems like a really delayed amount of time. Um, and to finish this punch list that apparently was defined in 2004. And, would we be seeking easements or the ownership fee interest? Um, the memo talked about easements might be preferred for liability reasons. I'm curious if we do easements or if we do the fee, are we receiving property taxes on what is considered a, what is a road right now? And if so, what, depending on how we go, which way, what cost that would be? Um, and what's the plan to cover the costs of the acceptance, the easements, the recording, the negotiations? Um, has there been any proposal by the HOA or the developer to assist in paying those costs that uh, the memo indicates could be substantial? I, I wanna make sure that Mandy, people heard Mandy Jo preface this by saying these are questions for the finance committee, okay? We're not gonna to try to answer them tonight. Given that, Chris, can I go ahead? Yes. Well, I could just answer one of these questions, um, sure. which is why it's taken so long. And I think there was, an allusion to that in the memo that um, first of all, in 2008, starting in 2007, I think we had a multi-year economic downturn and the um, so the developer didn't have enough money to finish the road and not as many people were 
buying lots, although Connie may have something to say about that. And then the other thing was Doug Cole passed away in 2010 and kind of threw everything into a cocked hat. And um, Tofino has been struggling to meet its um, responsibilities since then. So it was uh, those two things that I identify as um, reasons for why it's taken so long. I must say that the Homeowners Association has been having conversations with Tofino Associates with the town engineer and with my office for at least, I don't know, six or eight years about this and trying to move this forward. And for whatever reasons, it hasn't um, been really brought forward until this time. So th that's my answer to question number two. Jason, are you able to now use your mic? Can you hear me now? Yes, but please speak loudly because okay. it's soft. Right, let me turn it up a little bit more. I found it under video settings. Excellent, thank you. Um, now where to go? Audio, try that. I'm gonna turn it all the way up. I hope I'm not screaming in anybody's ear. That's fine, good? no further. <laughs> okay, good. Um, so, so the first question, one of the first earlier questions was how does the town benefit from this? And so the road mileage would count towards our chapter 90 allotment once we accept it as a town way. It's a, it's a small fraction in a large, uh, a large calculation, but it's a fraction. One more dollar we get is one more dollar we can spend. Um, and then the road conditions. Um, we actually had them driven in our pavement analysis um, last round, 2021. And they came out, I think one was a 53 and one was a 60 something. So they're, they're poor and fair conditions. Um, so they do would need some sort of treatment soon to bring them back to like a, a drivable. And if we let them sit for much longer, they'll need full depth reconstruction. So and there's a much larger punch list than the 2004 punch list at this point. So okay. I think that's all I, all I have to say about that for now. I encourage people to try to walk the sidewalks there if you're really interested in, in seeing what condition the roads are. Pat, would you mind if I go ahead and call on Douglas Donnell and Connie Kruger first? No, no, go ahead. Okay. I have Douglas. a mini question. I can wait. Oh, hey, Douglas, why don't you unmute and go ahead and okay. welcome. Um, thank you, Lynn. Uh, thank you, council members. My name is Douglas Donnell. I live at 46 Hopbrook. Um, and I am the current president of the Meadows Homeowners Association. So um, you, we're really happy to be able to, to be petitioning before the town council at this point. Um, members of our association have been working on this for a very long time. Um, there have been a lot of obstacles to getting the road accepted. Uh, but I wanna emphasize that it, the, the road was expected to be accepted as a public way since it was initially developed as a subdivision. So this is not a controversial or unexpected or um, sudden decision. This was an expectation that was created when the subdivision was created in the late 90s. The subdivision was finished in 2004 and it has taken 20 years for us as homeowners to get this presented to the town to be taken as a public way. So we are 28 households in the two roads. Um, and everyone who purchased a home here purchased it under the expectation that they were living and going to live on a public way. So it has never really been considered to be a private road. It's a, it's a road that was developed by a developer. And then when the development was completed, the road would be transferred to the town, which was the basis of the original subdivision agreement. Um, there, from our perspective, there's been a number of other factors than, than those that have been outlined in the history that have also contributed to why this has taken so long. Um, I don't really want to take up a lot of time with that here for you guys uh, that can maybe get explored in the uh, um, the finance committee or however you decide to uh, further understand the situation. Um, but a couple things that did happen was the town had voted or the planning board had voted in 2001 
to collect a $130,000 surety from the developer. Um, that unfortunately never occurred. They collected $20,000 and there was, and that was the extent of it. There's now a $20,000 escrow account towards the costs of finishing the punch list that was developed in 2004, but there's not the $130,000. So that work was never completed. Um, we as the homeowners have been pursuing this for at least eight years. We've been actively pursuing this for the last five years. Um, and by actively, I mean contacting whoever we can contact uh, in particular Tofino, uh, but also various um, you know, department heads within the town. Uh, we've gotten estimates for having the, the roads fixed. We've um, had numerous meetings of the association and formed a subcommittee to do that. So that's a little bit of the background. Um, we also understand as the homeowners association that this is a first for you guys. So we just want you to know that we are here as cooperative partners in, in doing this together. We understand that this is your first time around for this so that there's a, um, you're gonna have a lot of questions and there's gonna be a certain amount of process involved just getting there. Um, we have retained counsel, legal counsel um, and but we've also intentionally chosen not to pursue litigation with the developer uh, and really want to see this resolved amicably and cooperatively, both with the developer and with the town. And so that is our uh, position. And we're looking forward to working with the town council to achieve that end. So thank you very much for hearing our petition. Douglas, thank you so much for those comments and that background. Connie? Yes, um, I'm Connie Kruger. I live at 15 Hopbrook Road. And I just want to share my perspective as a longtime homeowner uh, in the Meadows uh, subdivision. In 1999, my partner Susan Tracy and I bought a building lot on Hopbrook Road from Doug Cole, Tofino Development, Cole Construction. At the time, I was employed as a senior planner in the town of Amherst. And I had seen the Meadows subdivision plan go through the standard approval process by the planning board. It was reasonable to expect that the town would accept, accept these roads within a few years of completion of the subdivision as these roads were built in conformance with the approved subdivision plan. And it's not unusual. It's just town meeting used to, and the select board used to do the approval process. The town has consistently um, accepted roads that are built to the subdivision standards. That's why people follow those requirements. However, the untimely death of Doug Cole due to complications from a liver transplant meant this did not happen in a timely manner. As you heard from Doug Dinell, on February 7, 2001, the planning board voted to require Tofino Associates to give the town $130,000 to cover completion of the remaining work. That was going to be 10,000 a lot as each lot was released and sold. For whatever reason, the planning department at that time never collected these funds. There's currently a little over $20,000 being held by the town, not nearly enough to cover the remaining work. For about five years, a subcommittee of the Association has been working to get the town and the developer to resolve issues and complete this project so these roads could be accepted. In October 2021, we were making progress. There was a meeting held at the DPW offices with Guilford Mooring, Jason Skeels, Ted Parker of Tofino, and three members of our association, including myself. The final list of items to be completed uh, was discussed and has yet to be produced as was promised in that meeting a year ago. So we're still waiting to, you're right, it does say may, Guilford Mooring may require more items, but we don't know what those items are. And we've been waiting for a year just for that list to be completed. So I'll conclude as one of the original homeowners in this neighborhood, it's very important to me that Tofino and the town come together as soon as possible 
to resolve any remaining issues and to have the town council finally vote to accept our roads, putting us on an equal footing with most of the other homeowners in town. Thank you for uh, hearing our petition. I just wanna add, I think our letter was a joint petition with Tofino Associates and the Meadows uh, Homeowners Association. So it actually, I, you know, Tofino could have been here as well. Um, any, any entity can be the petitioner and we are the joint petitioners. So thanks for your time. Thank you, Connie. Pat, I'm gonna come back to you for your questions. Yes, this is um, a quick, quick indulgence. Uh, there's a small driveway road, dirt thing, uh, called Allen Mill Road in District, Allen Mills Road in District Two. People use it to uh, get access to Amethyst Brook, but it's just a block from the actual entrance. But it, I've already been uh, asked why um, it can't be a road. Why aren't we treating roads equally um, <laughs> since this came out? So I'm interested in, is there a specific road mileage that is a requirement to make a public road? And what are, are there standards or conditions um, that the road needs to be into in to become a public road uh, that are taken on by the owners as they were originally here. So I, again, it's an indulgence, but I do need the answers to those questions. And if somebody could give me them now or email them to me, it would help. <laughs> um, Jason, did you have your hand up to answer that question? Yeah, I could answer it. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. I'm yes. nervous about my volume now. All right. Um, so the road would have, would have had to have been built to the subdivision standards, which is a, there's a minimum width. There's typically a required turnaround at the end, usually a cul-de-sac, not necessarily, that's not hard and firm. It could be a hammerhead style turnaround and it would have to be paved to the minimum thickness paved standards. So those are, those are there's, there's a, a lot more requirements than just that, but that sort of sums it up for where Alan Mills falls very short. Thank you very much. <laughs> and, and let me just say in Pat's in my district, we've had other discussions about other roads very recently as well. So um, one of the reasons why I think it's extremely important for the council to understand, first of all, what Meadows has gone through to get to this point uh, but also um, that we in fact do have requirements before we can accept a road or even begin to think about accepting a road. And that doesn't even get into all those financial questions that Mandy Jo asked, which I'll just be adding to when I get to the finance committee. Um, Jennifer, question. Yeah, so I, my question is, are the further negotiations between the town and Tofino or with the, is it, what I was hearing is the issue where the punch list isn't being maybe completed is with Tofino. So that is that who the town needs is continuing to work with? Chris or Jason would are one of you able to answer that? Jason. I've created several punch lists over the years, um, pretty much one every other year. I walk the entire road, note all the defects, put a list together. Um, I believe those have been sent to Tofino. Um, and then the last set of negotiations was at a planning board meeting that I was on vacation for. So, and, and at some point that sort of referred back to the 2004 punch list items. So, and I'm a little Chris. confused as to how that occurred since there's many more things that have arisen since 2004. Okay, thank you, Chris. So it is a little bit murky, I must admit. Um, I received information from Ted Parker telling me that um, he had spoken to um, Jason and that there were essentially three items that needed to be completed. And those were given to me in an email and I um, put them into the email that I sent to the town manager that he, um, he sent to you all. So those were the three items that Ted Parker was definitive about that needed to be done. But I have seen the punch list from 
a while ago, and it does include many more things than that. And it was unclear to me whether um, the town or the DPW was going to require those things to be completed before accepting the road. So it's, I, I wouldn't say I have a clear picture of this. Can I, I just need to build on your question. Uh, although Paul, you have your hand up. Go ahead. You can build on the question first. Well, it, bringing something to the town council where we still have issues to resolve makes me as a counselor want to say, get those issues resolved and then we can deal with this. But what, and I, cause I feel like leaving residents hanging out there as this has happened now for any number of reasons, not necessarily the towns is something we just can't continue to do. So I, I appreciate um, Chris's comment that it's murky, but somewhere in here, we need to get these resolved so that we aren't continuing to sit on this for the next 25 years. Paul. So I think there are a lot of interests at play here. I think it almost always revolves around who's going to pay. Right. So the understanding is that the developer pays and that did not happen. Tofino is, you know, that's why, and Tofino is somewhat out of the picture at this point in time. They've sold all their lots, with, but that's a question, but they're, they're still involved. I mean, Ted Parker's still included. So this is a broader conversation. The homeowners association brought the petition so that's why it got before you. And so I think that was, you know, that this is gonna help generate the, the solution uh, so that you're, you're, you're accepting this onto your agenda, we'll move this forward. Um, but it, essentially the question for the council is going to be what, what kind of road do you want to accept it as a public way? Um, you know, what kind of condition are you willing to accept it as a public way? It's a, it's a choice you have. Uh, the, from the property owner's point of view, they feel like they've paid what they feel should have been paid um, and that they've, they're they paying taxes as if it were a public way. So they feel like they have some entitlement. Um, the town from its point of view is we've been paving, we've been um, plowing the road um, because it is treated as a public way in many ways. So I think there's a lot of, diff it's a, it's a, there's a lot of stuff at play. Um, it s seemed to make, and, there was no easy resolution and barring going into litigation, which I think the homeowners association was hoping not to do. Right. Um, maybe this is a way to move it forward. Um, Douglas, you have your hand up. Please unmute. Uh, thank you. Sorry. I'm not quick on that. Um, yeah, we, we are coming before the town because we were advised. Uh, we went to the planning board and we, were advised to petition the town as a way to move this process forward, even with the punch list unresolved in that meeting with the town, although there was a somewhat informal agreement between the superintendent and the planning board and ourselves and Tofino that the three items that were mentioned in Chris's his, uh, history were the punch list, quote unquote. Um, but we, as homeowners, find ourselves in this sort of catch-22, where mm -hmm. we can't we can't affect anything here. We don't own anything. We have we don't really have any agency. We um, we are petitioning the we've we've gone to Tofino, and Tofino has in 15 years been basically very unresponsive, and now we're coming to the town in an effort to make public our situation in an effort to just accomplish what from our perspective should have just been a fairly uncontroversial and somewhat standard transfer of the, the, the road as a development into the public way, uh, you know, 20 years ago. So just to add that to the, to the mix. Right. And I thank you for that. And I, it's my understanding that you're unfortunately not the only a uh, subdivision, if you will, in this situation, Chris. That is, that is correct. <laughs> yes. I just Chris. wanted to clarify that it was really Guilford Mooring, the superintendent of public works who recommended that the residents file a petition letter 
it wasn't really the planning board per se. It was Guilford Mooring. So thanks. That's I just wanted to clarify that. To be honest, I don't care who, but it's now out in the public. So I think that's where the uh, goal was of the Homeowners Association. Douglas, did you have an additional comment you wanted to make at this time? Okay, Kathy. Yeah, I just, um, I have a question whether by bringing a petition to us, does that increase the leverage against the developer? Because it feels like this is the issue that things haven't been done on even the short punch list. And there may be a longer punch list that hasn't emerged. So is the idea that by coming to us, it increases the leverage or Paul, you said it's all about money by coming to us does it shift who will pay for the deficiencies of the road. Um, and I, I know that's going to be a question on finance, but does it we're giving up that the developer is never going to come up with 130,000 or the 110 or and therefore the town will take on that and I just I don't need that answered right now, but I think when the finance committee is looking at it if it's it's not to get new leverage, it's just to shift the cost. That's a, it's a different issue. Um, and I'm totally sympathetic with buying a house with some assurance that you would have decent roads and doing everything you can for 20 years. And there's an un, undone list. Um, I live on a state road, so at least it gets done on some regularity. <laughs> but anyway, I, I just wanna understand, does this increase leverage um, by the publicity of it, by something? I, I'm not sure I understand that. Paul, did you wanna comment on that? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I kind of assumed that might be your answer. Connie, did you wanna comment on that? You're, you're muted, Connie. Uh, um, let me let me give it a, a try. Um, it's not it's not so much leverage. It's trying to cut through the extreme length of time to get a resolution. Um, I think Tofino has some ability to pay, but no one's ever really finalized what that list is. So here's two perspectives. I can do this without muddying the water. Uh, Tofino's perspective might be if we had finished everything in 2004, we would have taken care of our obligation and the road could have been accepted and whatever deterioration uh, and, and falling apart, falling in storm drains and whatever would have been the towns and we would have been out of it. So our obli Tofino's obligation, they feel, is to complete what they didn't do the first time. And the town might say now, okay, it's 2022, there's a lot more work that needs to be done because of deterioration that's happened in the last 15 years. So um, Tofino should pay for that too. Tofino saying we should pay to finish what we didn't finish the first time. Now, I think as homeowners, we understand if the town accepts the road, it doesn't mean the town's gonna come and repave and put everything ship shape. There are other roads in town that are actually in worse shape than ours. It just means it becomes the town's responsibility on the long list of roads that need repair. Right now, Tofino owns that road. We couldn't even get repair work done on it if we wanted to. So it's, it's more trying to seek a resolution. We don't know how to get the town of Tofino to finally decide what that actual list is, a little bit like the library conversation, what is the cost right now to make it acceptable? And we don't know. So. Okay. I just wanna remind the council that we've not put the motion in place, I'm, although I'm about to, uh, that this is a referral. We are not going to resolve this this evening, okay? Uh, Jennifer and Shalini, I'm gonna take your comments or questions, and then I'm gonna put the motion on the floor. This could be answered another time. I'm just um, maybe water under the bridge, but why wasn't the 100 and it sounds like some before anybody who is with the town now was here, somebody dropped the ball on collecting the $130,000 bond. I just be a little curious about that. Thank you. There's probably nobody in this room that was in town government at that time, except maybe someone. <laughs> I, maybe I was. <laughs> Connie Kruger, you were. It wasn't yes. me. And would you like to tell us the answer to the question? <laughs> um, 
I think if you go back to the minutes of that meeting, which I know uh, planning director Ms. Brestrup has, you can see who was responsible, but um, it, it wasn't in my bailiwick at the time. Okay. But Thank I was you. there. If we could write a case study on this. Uh, Shalini? Mm -hmm. um, so I'm completely sympathetic with the residents because when they bought the house or built the house, there was an expectation uh, that there is an arrangement between Tofino and the sub uh, Tofino and the town that the subdivision has been approved and the roads once they're built will be taken over by the town. My question was that you know the murkiness is like if the town had taken it over in 2004, then this deterioration wouldn't happen. But the reason the town didn't take the road or adopt the road in 2004 was because it wasn't completed at that point. And ever since it's not been completed and other things keep happening. So is that accurate? I think that's the catch 22. Yes. No, what is the catch 22 about it? Like they were supposed to complete it. And I understand there was, a, you know, there was economic downturns. There were all those reasons, but uh, there are reasons for it and I'm not blaming them why, but we need, it, we don't want to murky the air, the responsibility. The responsibility was of the developer to finish the roads up to a certain standard that has to be adopted by the town. And for whatever reasons, they were not able to do it. Right. So in my mind, it's not murky. It's like they're supposed to complete it and the residents should be entitled to a finished road that the town takes over. And then from then onwards, the town is responsible. We cannot say like, oh, we have other roads that are not done. So let this be also, but down the road, it is going to be our responsibility to, you know, meet the potholes. And I get calls all the time and emails all the time about potholes. And uh, so this really does not seem too murky to me. In my mind, it is something that, you know, it is unfortunate that we did not collect the guarantee money of 130,000 because if that was there, we could have used that to maybe do the repairs. So A, Tofino did not give the guarantee, guaranteed money for whatever reason. Two, they did not complete the roads to standard. Three, they have delayed the process for so long. So I don't see what is the murkiness, like where does the town, come in and become accountable for taking over that cost that should have been the developers. If anybody wants to try to go at it, um, fine, but I'm actually going to suggest that the finance committee try to sort that particular item out. So I'm gonna make the motion and look for a second. And if we have to get um, to questions later, not so fast, Anna. Um, Okay, the motion is to um, ex express the town council's intent to accept as public the roadways and easements of the meadows at Amherst Field Division as shown on the Huntley subdivision plans dated February 24, 1995. That's the first motion. Is second. there a second? Second. Anarchy. Okay, Dorothy, do you have a question on the motion? I just want to say how it happened, why it happened. It's a long time ago. I just think we should solve this thing and not spend a whole lot of time. We've got a lot of big problems to deal with. It seems reasonable for the town to take over the road, and I, I support that. Yeah, we're not voting on that tonight. Mm. Shalini. Okay, so I feel it sets so up. Uh, a precedent for other developers to make commitments to do developments under certain standards and then not do it and hope that the town is going to pick up the mm -hmm. undone work. Shalini, I think we're going to resolve this at another meeting before we come back to the council. Okay. Um, so the motion has been made and seconded. Is, are there any other comments or questions? If not, we're going to move to the vote. Anna Devon Gothier. I was eating my snack. I, sorry. Aye. I, I, I'll, I'll say it again while still Aye. Mandy Johanneke. Aye. Anika Lopes. Aye. Michelle Miller. Aye. Dorothy Pam. Yes. Pam Rooney. Aye. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. 
Aye. Jennifer Taub. Aye. Alicia Walker. Aye. Shalini Balmilne. Yes. Patty Angelis. Aye. Okay, the second motion is related to this and it is to refer the proposed acceptance of the roadways and easements of the meadows at Amherst Fields Division as shown on the Huntley subdivision plans dated February 24th, 1995 to the planning board and finance committee for review and recommendation to the town council by October 27th. Is there a second to the motion? Second, Haneke. I just wanna ask before we move on, is there anybody that feels this needs to be referred to any other committee? See no suggestion of that. The motion's been made and seconded. Are there any other questions? Seeing none, we're going to move to the vote. The vote is, uh, we'll begin with Griesmer, who's an aye. Mandy Jo. Aye. Hanneke. Anika Lopes. Aye. Michelle Miller. Aye. Dorothy Pam. Yes. Pam Rooney. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Aye. Alicia Walker. Aye. Shalini Balmilne. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. And Anna Devon Gothier. Aye. Both motions were passed unanimously. Um, thank you. Uh, and Connie and Douglas, thanks for joining us. We will be seeing you, I'm sure, at finance committee meetings at some point. Um, our next action item is actually A, and it is the proposed special act on residential property transfer fees. You have a document in your packet, and you also have a general doc, a document that generally describes the filing of special acts. Uh, but with that, I'm going to call on, on Devon Gothier and Mandy Johanneke, who are the sponsors. All right. First off, Mandy and I have agreed not to introduce any new chaos in your lives for a little while after this one. So this is the last thing that we co-wrote for a little bit. Um, so this was something that I had in my head for a while uh, and was figuring out the right way to bring to the council. And Mandy Joe agreed to jump in and work on it with me. I'm very grateful for that. So first I want to thank Mandy for, for tag teaming this. Essentially, when we looked at what we're facing as a town, we were realizing that, well, we weren't realizing, we already knew it. We had a whole discussion on it earlier today. Capital costs are skyrocketing. We're seeing pressure on our operating and capital budgets, especially. And we're also seeing an extreme need for both lowercase and capital A affordable housing, meaning um, designated affordable housing with income limits, but also uh, middle income and, and lower income housing without necessarily a program running it. So looking at what other cities and towns have done across Massachusetts, we saw that there were several towns and cities who have implemented a real estate transfer fee. This fee is, it would be a special act, and so it goes through the legislature, but it allows cities and towns, it's done differently in, in all of them, to impose a specific fee on certain real estate transactions that benefit certain things. So kind of fill in the blanks there, right? So what we have written is a special act that would impose a 2% uh, fee on property transfers to be regulated by bylaw. So essentially what we're saying to kind of put it in plain English is we are asking the state legislature to allow us to have the right to impose a real estate transaction fee on certain property transfers, and we have the right to, to delineate that where, that where that goes. What we are um, putting in our sample bylaw, so what you have in your packet after the memo is the proposed special act, and then a proposed bylaw. Um, the bylaw, we, are, we would wait until the special act was passed in order to formalize and, and work on as a, as a council. However, the goal of the bylaw is that, and the special act, is that there are two types of property transfers that would have this fee associated with them. The first is on, uh, on homes, on the homes that sell for over 200% of the average assessed price of a single family home. And that 2% fee would be on the amount over the 200% mark. So if the, uh, I included a super fun Excel spreadsheet for you with this, but um, if the average median price were 300,000, these are fake numbers right now. If the average assessed price were 300,000, 200% of that 
um, would be 600 and we'd look at the fee on the amount over. The second would be um, a 2% property transfer fee on homes that did not qualify for a homestead certificate, which means that they are not owner occupied uh, or not the primary home of the owner. So this would be second homes and non-owner occupied rentals. Uh, so I threw some math at you. I did uh, check my math with the um, the with Sean Mangano and our, our wonderful assessor Kim. Um, I believe that the second Excel sheet has the up numbers. I did the math right. I didn't have the right uh, average assessed price. So if you look at the Excel sheets, those would have, those would be the numbers for 2021. Last thing is that what Mandy and I decided on is we looked at um, how to where to put the money, right, when it comes in. And I know that this council has had a hesitation around dedicated funding streams, and I respect that. But one of the reasons to do this special act is to help to protect and expand affordable housing. So we have written it so that regardless of how much comes in, the first 250000 would be allocated to the Affordable Housing Trust. Beyond that, the council can uh, decide the, the percentage, but we would be creating a um, capital stabilization fund and, a, and, um, and then between that and the operating budget. So the capital stabilization fund would be to support the inflation impacts that we're seeing on our capital projects. And um, we all know what the general operating budget is. I know this is complicated. I know it's a lot. And I know it's hard to kind of wrestle with the special act in the bylaw. The, the long and short of it is that we are writing this so that we as a council get to decide where this funding goes. Um, and I will see if Mandy wants to add anything, because I'm sure I left a lot out. Anna covered most of it. I just, I just want to say the bylaw itself is truly a sample. Um, don't look at it and say, this is what would get proposed if we're successful with the special act at the legislature. It's a sample to give you an idea of what a bylaw would look like. And because the special act we've written very generally, it would it, it gives a better idea of where we're going with this whole concept. Um, and the only the other thing I want to add is we wrote the special act generally because it's really hard, number one, to get a special act passed. Um, and once it's passed, if it's in the special act, you have to get the legislature to amend the special act to change anything that's in the special act. Whereas if you've written it so flexibly that you're putting it all in a bylaw once you get it passed, then you can more flexibly change things if you wanna do stuff. So, so that's what we're gonna to need to look at. We hope you refer it that even things like the 250, we may want to change to more flexible numbers in, in the special act or something um, so that it's more flexible. But that's the reason why if you just read the special act, you're gonna be like, you're putting a 2% fee on everything. <laughs> that's not the goal, but the reason it's in there is so that we can see what works, see what number works. 2% might be too high. A half a percent might be fine. You know, um, See what works and be able to tailor those exemptions. There's a lot more exemptions in the bylaw, the sample bylaw than there is in the special act. Um, and there are more that many other towns have proposed in things um, that we would certainly look at when we got to the bylaw stage. So excited for all your questions. Lynn? Okay, Kathy. Thank you. Um, I like this idea a lot. So uh, it, uh, it's been, um, I wish I had thought of it, you know, because, but just on terms of we need revenue. So what you're looking for is revenue. So um, I think I'll reserve my specifics questions on percents and amounts. As you said, the bylaw could be written later. So the, the idea of a special act, it's that the state legislature has to allow us to do something like this because this is not a property tax, you know, so it's it's allowing us to get away from two and a half. Um, we can impose other fees so that I'm just wondering why we, my question is really, why do we need special legislation? And I'm sure there's a good answer to it because all the other towns that do this must have gotten their special legislation. Correct. Why doesn't the state just allow anyone who wants to do this to do this? Why do we have to do this step? May I answer that question? Please. Thank you. I'm so glad you asked. Uh, so there's actually a bill put forth by Senator Comerford right now that would do just that. So I'm going to mess up the number. I'm so sorry. So I'm not even going to try to get the number right. However, 
Uh, Senator Comerford has introduced and is continuing to work on a bill that would allow towns to impose a property transfer fee without needing to go through the legislature. But right now, you do. So uh, we should support that bill too. Um, and, and to be clear, you know, in speaking with Senator Comerford, this only supports her bill. It is not in conflict with it. Thanks. The bottom line is we can't do this without legislative permission. That's what I was looking for, but it was also, right. it just seems like to ask every town to do this is, is a very inefficient way of, towns yeah. still would always have the option to do it or not do it, right? Correct. Right. Yep. Uh, Pam. So my only, thank you again, also. Um, my only question is, so does, um, does the state accept this petition, if you will, with the um, with the draft bylaw as kind of a package, so they say we we do this as a package, a little bit like the MOU we discussed earlier. With certain parameters, we'll say yes. If the if the parameters change, we're going to come back to you and say no. The, but it basically, I? special legislation requires that the town council vote to submit it to the legislature, and it. And then the, it goes through its own process in the legislature and has to then also be approved by the governor before the town can do it. But that doesn't answer your question. No, I, I, okay. I can. Maybe so Jeff. the only thing that would get proposed in the legislature is the special act. The bylaw would not be trans, the sample bylaw would not right. be transmitted over. So that's a separate thing. Um, our bylaw is based, there, there were nine of these proposed special acts in the legislature this past, this current term um, that is now in informal session. Um, they varied from a page and a half about, uh, ours is a, about a page and a half, about our length to about 10 pages. And um, some got very specific. We chose the non-specific route to give us as much flexibility. And so the, the non-specific ones are very general like these, like the one we've proposed. Uh, Dorothy? Um, Mandy Jo is partly answering in this. Um, this is not a brand new idea. You, other towns have been doing it. Um, do you want to share some of the um, successes or how you think it's working well in other towns? Sure, so um, I'm happy to point out some of the ones that I was most intrigued by, um, but I'm also happy to put together a document for uh, the committees that this is going to and, and share it with the council that um, I have a table that compares them, um, mm -hmm. if that would be helpful. I think the two that I was particular, or the three I was particularly intrigued by were Somerville, Cambridge, and Nantucket. Okay, thank you. And Mandy, I'm sure has her own interests. As and, well. and those, those three are pending in the legislature now. I, I'm, I think Nantucket is potentially the only town that's been successful in getting some sort of special act yeah. related to this, but it, maybe it's not Nantucket, it's Martha's, Martha's Vineyard. Vineyard. Martha's yeah. Vineyard's been, been the only one that's been successful, I think, in getting something actually passed. And I'm not sure it's exactly equivalent to this because it's a land bank. Um, of some sort, so it's similar, and this is this is the method many towns have been towns and cities have been cho choosing to go since that success at Martha's Vineyard um, on that similar matter. Um, but yeah, nine, and they all sat in committee. <laughs> but we have wonderful legislators who aren't going to let that happen, right? I hope so. We'll get to some other special acts later tonight. Um, Pat DeAngelis. Thank you. First, I do not want Anna and Mandy Jo not to uh, submit other legislation over this next year, please. Most of your work is excellent, even when I don't agree with it. Uh, this I happen to agree with um, very strongly. I am concerned about the limit, you know, 200, and 50,000 for the housing trust, that really needs to be looked at. They need more money if you're gonna set a specific figure, doubling it easily would, would uh, enable their work. But I think more you wanna start thinking about percentages for um, the housing trust and for the general fund, et cetera. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Um, I will share our initial uh, rationale behind setting the set number. We actually, we really appreciated how 
uh, the reparations funding was established with the set number and then the remaining went elsewhere. And um, we modeled that, however, Mandy and I have talked about, and we've, we've also uh, brought this to the housing trust. We're gonna discuss it at their next meeting. Um, and, and that was raised there as well as, as increasing that number. So Mandy and I have talked about, we're open to that. This is, I mean, this is the beauty of committee process, right? Is that we all now get to shape this um, and I'll put kind of put our stamps on it in different ways. And um, thank you, yeah. Michelle. Uh, yeah, I really want to support increasing that 250 as well. Um, I, I think that would be really powerful to do that. And I just really want to commend both of uh, the counselors who put this together. I think it's um, it was an extraordinary amount of work and you can tell just by looking at it. And I know it took a lot of thought. And so I just really want to share my appreciation. Um, and I also wanted to ask, is it... Uh, necessary in the special act to include the amounts as you have, or could you potentially leave the spe special act more general? And then when the bylaw is written, you know, it would be, uh, it would be created off of the bylaw that split or whatever split. So various current applications do it differently. Many actually choose to just submit it to, to have the money go to one place. And so then it's just in the bio, in the special act for one place. I do believe though that those towns and cities that start with choosing two places um, sometimes do not put the split in the special act. And so as we did with at least the stabilization fund and the general fund, I believe we could have a split three ways they might want to see at least a percentage for one of them, but it could be written in many different ways to put a, to set a floor for say the housing trust with then the rest between the housing trust and the other twos by bylaw type thing too. You know, there's, there's just a lot of ways to write that. Um, I don't know whether we can get as general as no, no numbers or no percentages, but, um, mm -hmm. but we can, we can look more closely at all the other ones to see if there are any that do no percentages or numbers at all if they're splitting it up. Thank you. Kat, uh, Kathy, recognizing that this is gonna to come to the finance committee where you're vice chair, you wanna raise your questions now? Yeah, it, this is a, a simple one, just on the wording, it says capital stabilization fund. I don't think we actually have something right now called okay. that. Um, so, so we have something called the stabilization fund. So it just, uh, and it's a, we can take this up later, but I like, I like the idea of something like that. So it was the idea we would actually be creating one. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And, and so if that's yes, that should be part of the discussion. Yes. Uh, stay tuned. That'll be a separate discussion, but so I guess there might very be well happen before we file this. Okay. It will come before the council before we file this. Let's put it that way. I can't predict what will happen with it. Okay. Shalini? Oh, can I just I say just Go ahead, um, Mandy when Sean reviewed this, he really liked the idea of a stabilization <laughs> fund too for capitals. Yeah. He oh. liked the idea so much that you're probably going to see it coming forward as a referral soon. <laughs> so, um, uh, Shalini. Yeah, again, oh, I think it's a brilliant idea. And uh, as we move forward with the, um, uh, studying it, I think what, what comes to my mind is uh, looking at the impact of it, I mean, our intentions are obviously that we, you know, raise funding for affordable housing, but despite the good intentions, sometimes bylaws like this, like I've seen that in this research on rent control, for example, is that it backfires and because if other towns close by are not having a similar uh, fee. Uh, then the builders or whoever are investing tend to move in those areas rather than building. So it just backfires that we actually don't end up having more of whatever we're looking for. I'm not saying this is exactly the same thing, but that's just something to look for is like, what is that amount that is not going to de uh, disincentivize people from uh, <laughs> doing that in our town? And what has been the impact looking at like in Martha's Vineyard, since when has it been there and what has been the impact of it? how much money was collected, uh, did it change the number of transactions? And so just looking at that more thoroughly. Thank you. Okay. Thank so, you. Oh. Question? 
Go ahead. Can I, is that a, mm -hmm. okay. Um, so I can say that I know for Amherst, I was able to pull our data on housing transfers fairly easily from our GIS site. And so that data is accessible if you wanted to look into it. Um, I'm sure that you'd be able to kind of look at the trends over time. Um, however, I also just want to reiterate the fact that doing this special act, and we know that it's tough to get a special act through, doing this special act supports other supports bills like Joe's that are like Senator Comerford's that are working to make this a right to be able to do it so that other communities don't have to go through this process. Um, and so it is, you know, ideally this passes, this could be hugely impactful for our town and in really wonderful beneficial ways. However, even if it doesn't pass, the act of filing it and the act of pushing on it um, is supportive of something that I'll speak for myself and I believe Mandy as well, we believe we shouldn't have to file a special act for. So um, we're, we are doing this in support of those other towns having the right in the future, uh, regardless of what happens with ours. And, and there may come a time where um, a document would come before the council and we vote to file a resolution about our support for the act once, probably in the next session of the legislature, since Joe will have to refile that bill. Um, Mandy Joe, did you have your hand up to answer um, a question? Yeah, I'll just answer yours, which is we already filed our support we did. with a right. resolution from last last year um, to, to Joe's bill. Um, Thank you. But um, I, I wanted to point out that the special act as written is a may do it. Um, so the bylaw would have, if the special act passes, it doesn't automatically institute a fee the council would then have to pass a bylaw to actually institute the fee. And, and that reason is, again, there are some special acts that were written where the fee goes in right at 2%, then you can never change the fee. If you see it's having negative yes. effects, yeah, you've yeah. got to go back to the legislature. Here we've gotten the May, the 2% is up to 2%, so we couldn't go higher, but if we enacted 2%, saw negative consequences, we could, we could come back lower. We could relook at it much more flexibly. And so that concern, is more to, to my thinking is more of a bylaw concern than a special act concern because getting a special act passed doesn't actually change anything other than allow us to pass a bylaw. Okay. Anika. Uh, yeah, so I just want to thank you for the work you, you've done to bring this to the table. Um, this is great. And I, I love how it's supportive of um, larger bills and uh, I think it's important. So. At this point, I just want to express my gratitude to you both. Thank you. Great. Jennifer. Yeah, and we've, um, I thank you for bringing this forward as well. We've, uh, there's been a lot of discussion for years about the fact that we, that property that's rented, that's income producing has never, doesn't contribute any greater amount to the town than non-income producing property. So this is a way to begin to address that, which I think is great and long overdue and welcome. Great. Well, in support of that, let's do the motion. And it's to refer the proposed special act on residential property transfer fees to the finance committee and the governance organization and legislation committee for review and recommendation to the town council by October 27. Is there a second? Second, Devlin Gothier. Any other questions or comments, Michelle? Sorry, just a process question. Does it have to go first to finance and get a recommendation out of there and then to GOL? Yes. Thank you. We've handed Andy two different big chunks tonight. Okay, any other questions on that? Seeing none, I'm going to move to the vote. Uh, Mandy Johannike is first. Aye. Anika Lopes. Aye. Michelle Miller. Aye. Dorothy Pam. Yes. Pam Rooney. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Aye. Alicia Walker. Aye. Shalini Palmilna. Uh, yes. Patty Angelis. Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. Lynn Griesmer is an aye. It's unanimous. And thanks for all your hard work to get us this far. All right. We are. Um, We've already done, oh no, we're doing the first reading on D, soliciting. Yes, we are now doing the proposed amendments to general bylaw 3.36 soliciting 
Uh, this is a first reading. It will come back to the council at the next meeting. Uh, and I'm looking to Michelle Miller for a report from GOL. Uh, I'm going to pass it to Mandy if she's okay with that. Mandy, would you offer it since you brought it forward? Thank you. So I think the GOL vote was unanimous to declare clear, consistent, and actionable. Okay. But um, this That's is the, the um, companion change to the one that was just passed under consent tonight of license fees and holders, right. common victuallers, and lunch carts. It's the only other bylaw in our bylaws that um, set a fee within the bylaw. And the plan here is to, uh, the proposal is to change it so that the Board of License Commissioners is the one that sets the fee and it's no longer in the bylaw. Okay, so this, you're saying this completes the set of ones we have to pay attention to? Yes. Great. Um, are there any questions at this time? Okay, I'm seeing none. Again, it will come back to the council uh, next week. Um, we are then moving on to, let's see, the next D and E were consent. We're moving on to the town council committee meeting format. And the reason this has come up is because last time we voted on this, we didn't have any state law uh, or it was about to expire. So uh, the legislature has extended the ability of the town council to meet as we have been, but we need to now make a decision as to whether, how we are going to continue to meet. Um, the let me just mention before we get into motions, et cetera. Whatever we do, counselors would still be allowed to attend virtually. So that's not the question on the table. The question on the table is, do we continue to meet in person as we are now and have the virtual option? The next question on the table is, do we bring the audience back into the room and respecting town, respecting limits of room capacity. And then the third thing that we always have to deal with when we do this is what will the committees of the council do? So with that, um, I've asked Athena to put the two motions up. So, thank you. So we have two options. Uh, the first motion is uh, moved effective immediately to hold all town council meetings in the in-person meeting format with the option of virtual meetings. If the president declares 24 hours in advance of a meeting that there will be fewer than five counselors physically present and with virtual public access until March 31, 2023. This motion is identical to what we presently are doing, and it is identical to the motion we did last time, except to change the dates. The other option is effective immediately to hold all town council meetings in the in-person meeting format with in-person public access and the option of virtual public access indefinitely. And this, um, this one basically, it all it does is remove the ability of the president to declare 24 hours in advance uh, that we won't be meeting in person. I, I, I want to mention that there is a possibility that we could decide we need to meet virtually because of inclement weather, and we never put that into the last motion. <laughs> so, um, because unfortunately with Zoom, you don't get snow days anymore. Um, so, uh, I'm interested in some council comments on the, either of the motions, and then I'd like to move one of them. Amanda Jo? Just, just two comments. I think um, inclement weather would be a better option than the, in, in terms of adding into a motion instead of the, if there's fewer than five counselors physically present, I'd, I'd more support an inclement weather one. And, um, I wouldn't say indefinitely. Um, I would go to the end of our term um, to allow each subsequent council to make their own determinations. I, I would like to not have to face this vote even next March, um, unless the law 
doesn't allow us to do whatever we're doing. And then obviously we would have to face it, but, you know, I think what we've been doing is working. Um, and so let's just say we're doing that to the end of our term. Either Paul or Athena, is there any reason we can't vote this indefinitely? Me, obviously, if the legislature changes something, then we'd have to come back. You're, you're asking if we could vote the first option indefinitely? Um, yeah, or some version the of the first, first option with, a, with an incumbent. Well, I would just change the second option to December 31, 2023, essentially. The, the end of, I know our terms like January, I don't know, fourth, right. fifth, <laughs> something like that. Um, I mean, even though the law only goes to March 31st, right. 2022, 2023, can we vote a motion that takes it to the end of our term? Our last meeting would be in December of 2023. Well, the motion, that second one, the in-person meeting format with in-person public access and virtual public, and the option of virtual public access is within the open meeting law. So if that March 31, 2023 comes and goes and there's not new special, special legislation, that would, we would just go back to the open meeting law provisions. And that's what that is. So I don't see any conflict with doing that. Okay. Um, I see hands up, Michelle. Um, if if we vote positively on the second one, does that still allow counselors to attend virtually if needed? Or yes. Okay, thank you, Kathy. I had this. I had the same question on both the first one and the second one. It doesn't say that. Um, and. We used to have the rule that you could only do X number. Did we delete that rule? Paul, actually, yes, go ahead, Athena. So Please use your mic so that we can hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. So my understanding is that if, if the council voted the second option, that we still wouldn't need a quorum present in the room because it, the special legislation hasn't expired. The thing that would change it after March 31, 2023 is that we would need a quorum in the room. Okay. So what would change if the council voted the second option would be that the public is now allowed to come in. Okay. And what the second option doesn't do is accommodate that there would be fewer than five counselors or inclement weather. Um, we would need to change the language if there's, if that's what the council wanted to do to be virtual if there's fewer than five counselors. I think that my opinion is that that, that could be confusing if for less than 24 hours before a meeting, we change the meeting format. So I might suggest that 48 hours before a meeting, we change the right. meeting format. Okay. Let me try this. Can I just say, I don't think the wording allows us to, in either one allows the hybrid one that we've been doing. And I don't see why in person, I understand you're saying it allows us to keep doing, but what we've got six people virtual right now, I, if the intent is to do that, why don't we write it there? I don't see that. It says in-person format, both of them say in-person for us. Um, I'm just, I, I don't think it's clear to me, Lynn, and we have- From the motion, and yet this is the motion we voted consistently. Okay. Right, it's it, the, the issue of whether you attend virtually or not has not been part of the council rules. It's been part of the town manager's memos. And Paul changed the limit of four to indefinite. Correct, Paul? Yep, I think the state law allowed that. The state allowed you to have these meetings virtually or in, or in person. Okay. So that, but that only, that extends on March till March 31st. Right. Then it then it goes back to the you must have a quorum in the in the room, and then whatever rules that we established, which require you to do all the advance notice and all that stuff if you're going to attend virtually. But we can okay. adjust that. Okay, Athena. Right. So all of that remote participation request that wouldn't start until March thirty first, twenty twenty three. Right. Up until now, so you don't have to request to be remote. I ask you to answer the poll but you don't have to request to be remote. 
Does that answer your question, Kathy? It, it does. Um, I just, if I read this, I wouldn't see that we could do the other. And on our books, we still have that special request. But if everyone interprets it that way, I'm fine because if this is the way we've been meeting and it continues, that's fine. So I do like legislative intent and we're having this. I just, I, I think the way we're doing it works. Um, and so the big question mm -hmm. is the difference between one and two is would there be people sitting in the room with us? Right. Mandy Joe. I, I was just gonna try to explain it otherwise uh, on a different way. Item two is basically pre-pandemic rules. Um, meaning pre-pandemic, we were in person, but there was always that remote option. Um, under state law, we couldn't not have it because the select board had adopted it, the manager had adopted it. So that's what this one is, is you're mainly in person, but you've still got that remote option under state law. The state law is actually now more flexible and more allowable than it was pre-pandemic. Um, I would still add the, I think to the second motion, I prefer the second motion, but I would add, um, um, with, I don't know how it would be worded, um, um, with the option of virtual meetings in inclement weather or something like that. Um, something that gives, we, we ran into that one time, I think last January where it started snowing in the middle and half of us had problems getting home. Right. Um, and so if that was going to be the case, it'd be nice to not have to cancel the meeting or, or just be able to say, look, snow's being called for, let's just do it right. virtually. And, and the one the one time I ever did use the five was we appeared to be getting an ice storm and people kept saying, I don't think I'm coming. And I finally said, well, then none of us are coming. So we didn't do it that night. We did, we had the meeting, but we didn't it virtually. Um, do we want to say indefinitely or do we want to say um, through the first meeting of the next term? I would just say December 31. Then that 2023. Leaves, then that leaves the same question I had to run into last time, and that is who decides how the next council is going to meet the first meeting. That's why I'd say it through the first meeting of the next council. So that you just the rule is there, and then the, the next council meets and then they decide. Kathy, you have your hand up. forgot to take it down. Jennifer? Yeah, so does this mean that then the next meeting, we could have people in person here? It means at the next meeting, we would have the uh, people could come in person. They could also attend virtually by Zoom. They can make public comment either way. And they can also watch on Amherst Media and then jump in by Zoom if they want to. And so are there COVID protocols still for how many people and? Yes. Paul, there is a limit on yeah, the, the capacity of the room, right? The, we still have a capacity of 40 people in this room. So if there's 13 counselors, two or three staff, be 20 people, whatever, who come in, we would set up the chairs here somehow if we had to accommodate counselors, counselors would probably have to gather, we'd probably put, have the counselors all sit in the same location and eliminate the tables so that the proximity of counselors, right now you're spread out, that would go away because we'd have to be able to accommodate up to 25 people in the audience. Yeah, I still I imagine most people would rather zoom in, but yeah. Yeah, we don't know. I mean, there's, there'll be some, yeah. Okay. It depends on the issue too. Yeah. you. It, there, this was this beautiful podium was built for 13 counselors. We used to have six more people sitting with us, not at those tables. Right, right. Um, but although I want to make sure people are comfortable with being closer. Okay. Uh, okay. I want to say until the through the first meeting of the next term. Okay, so this is the motion. Uh, Michelle, you have a question? I do, I have a, a comment. Um, so I really wanna get 
to a place where we have people in the room. Um, I, I think the public, I, I think we'll be surprised that the public may, it's depending on the issue, want to come um, to show support or to voice themselves. Um, but I do have some concern, particularly given recent events um, and uh, that have occurred um, about security. And I'm just wondering if, since I haven't been on the council at any time when there have been people who've come into the room, although I've been one at times, um, I'm just wondering if people have to register uh, to be part of the public in the room or if there's some protocol or is it basically just anybody who shows up can, if they're the first 30 or whatever Paul said, um, can come into the room? Paul? Anybody can show up. They do not have to identify themselves. They can just be present. We, the only issue for us is that we would have to limit the number we'd have to have if we thought there would be more than the, 50, the 20 people coming into the audience we'd have to accommodate either relocate the meeting to us to a space that could accommodate the larger crowd or have some kind of overflow or something like that so if we know that there are going to be 100 people showing up we can't have the meeting in this room we have to accommodate that that space. It's I also want to point out that there's no other room that accom can accommodate both virtual and in-person public comment. And this is the only room. Right. So the second thing on top of that is that we are talking just about the town council meetings. Right. Um, right. There are you know 40 other committees that want to meet and some want to meet in person, some want to meet remotely, being able to support them. We have our IT director here all night tonight with you to accommodate Thank things. You. Um, so it'll be based on our ability to deliver the service. I think, you know, for us, it's easier to either be in person mm -hmm. or to be remote. Right. These hybrid meetings are intense. Michelle, did you have a further question on that? I, I'm just wondering if anyone else shares the security concerns or has anything that might ease my concerns, but um, I'll just put that out there. Thanks. Dorothy? Or Paul, did you have a further question about that? Yeah, I mean, it, I think it's a real legitimate concern. There have been instances of, um, and, and we can offer the council what we call Alice training, which is training for a potentially violent situation and it teaches you how you can respond. Uh, we've done it for our town staff. We continue to train staff on situations like this. Um, you know, schools do trainings on this, on this as well. Um, so we can offer it to uh, volunteer boards as well, if you'd like that. Right. But Michelle, I appreciate your concern and it didn't fall on silent ears. Okay. Uh, Dorothy? I feel that we've reached a different time um, and I do share the security concerns. Uh, who, who wants to be in the audience in person? So many people tell me how much they love being able to attend a Zoom meeting from their home. Um, when we do it in the meeting, if you come in person, these town council meetings last forever. So that means people in an audience sitting close together, even if it's only 25, that's close together for long hours. And that's something that we try to avoid, those of us who are trying to avoid getting COVID. Um, we don't stay seated unmasked with people for a long period of time. The experience of being in person under the COVID circumstances for me was, I really hated it. Um, I'm sitting there masked and I'm having to talk that way. And then I'm using a computer and not dealing with the people in the room. It seemed to be, I feel much closer to the meeting coming from my own house with my face on the screen, unmasked, looking at other counselors, real faces, not mask faces. I, I don't, I think the things have changed. And um, I think that there's a lot of bad things about COVID, but I'm really happy about the Zoom meetings when it comes to something like town council. The only change, and you did mention you were gonna discuss this, is that the audience has complained again and again. They want to all know, they wanna know who else is in the room, which means that attendees, I see the attendees because I'm a principal of this meeting. But when I go, even as a town counselor, to another meeting by Zoom, I have no idea who's in the audience because those that is not accessible to me. I can't see that. 
Um, I don't think you have to bring people in and show their faces. I mean, that's something you can do and you, you do it selectively now and then, but at a minimum, list the people that are in the attendees because you can do it and you're doing it for those who are running the meeting. So why not for the people in the audience too? Um, I, I think that the Zoom meetings make it possible for so many more people to participate in the meetings. When I go out amongst crowds and see a lot of people, they're telling me they're watching these meetings. I mean because they're commenting on what I say. So I know they're watching the meetings. And I don't think that was the way it was before. You would come to a meeting if you had some issue that you were bringing before the board. But now a lot of people do take the time to watch the meetings. They watch the finance meetings. They watch the library meetings. And um, you know that's, to me, the good side of the COVID thing, that we've learned how we could do this in a very democratic way. Anna. I just respectfully wanted to explain um, that the reason why the audience cannot see the list of people is because this is a webinar style Zoom meeting. If you are a panelist, you can see the Zoom. Anyway, the, the um, folks who are listed as panelists who are in the room with their videos on right now can see the audience. Actually, there is not a way for the audience to see the list of names uh, short of screen capturing it. Athena. You wanted to say something on that. I just wanted to address one of those comments. In At in-person meetings prior to any Zoom meetings, we've never asked people to sign in and then shared that list yeah. publicly. And I, I have a you know, strong hesitation that there is an expectation that people who come to a public meeting where they are allowed to come and go as they please be expected to register in any way, and then that information be shared publicly. Um, I think there could be some serious concerns about doing setting a precedent for that kind of registration and then sharing that registration process. I, I understand that people have wanted this. I also want to point out that we have no list of all the people watching on Amherst Media. And some people may watch on Zoom, because it's just easier than watching on Amherst Media or they want to make a public comment. At one point today, we had 33 people in the Zoom meeting. And yet when we called for public comment, nobody wanted to make it. They just chose to watch by Zoom. Um, Michelle? I, I Athena, certainly don't want to um, be in opposition to what you just said, but I, I, I remember seeing somewhere and I can't remember where I will try to find it that there are, there is somewhere some, some procedure around public meetings and having to, you know, register a spot. Um, so I don't know where I saw it, but um, I, what I'm hearing you say is that that's not something that you're aware of. Is that, is that true? Athena. We can't require people to re pre-register before they attend a public meeting. That may have been different at district meetings, um, but we can't. We cannot have a pre-registration process to that is required for people to come to meetings when council meetings are taking place in the town room, and the room is open to the public. This is a public space, and people can come and go as they wish. We do have. Um, a registration process if people wish to make a public comment. So at that's what I person meetings, if folks wanted to make public comment, they would sign in so that the president could call on them when it was time. That's exactly what I was remembering. Thank you for it's, it's for public comment purposes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Dorothy, do you, you still have your hand up? I can't hear you. Okay. Um, when you're in the room, you just look around the room and you see the people. Okay, so it's not that people were attending meetings incognito. Um, we could see them. And now people can't see the people and they can't see their names. And um, I think that's a, a something that's not good. So that's it. Pam? Yeah, I'm not trying to prolong the conversation here, but why is the first, the first option crossed out now? <laughs> I'm about to make the motion and it's going to be the second option. What if we don't want the second option? <laughs> then you can vote against it. So I, so if we're going to talk about the second option, mm -hmm. it says that 
is that the counselors will be in the in-person meeting format. It does not say anything about the counselors being able to be remote. Neither does case, the first in, in, option. In case, I know, because that's, and that's what we pointed out, okay. is that it didn't include that possibility. If somebody would like to come up with a statement effective immediately to hold all town council meetings in the in-person meeting format with the option of counselors attending remotely. Lynn? Huh? It's not this motion that allows less than a quorum to be present. It's the special act that allows less right. than a quorum to be present. So that's why it hasn't been included in the motions in the past. That's why it's not in this motion. So once the special legislation expires, then we will be required to have a quorum in the room. So we just haven't put that in the motion because it's assumed that okay. we're going to follow the law. Pam, does that make sense to you? I, I can try a motion. So, go ahead. Um, so Athena, I would just be adding after the in-person meeting format, the phrase with remote participation as permitted by law. Excellent. Okay, so the motion that I'm going to now make is effective immediately to hold all town council meetings in the in-person meeting format with remote participation as permitted by law with in-person public access and the option of virtual public access in the event of inclement weather, the president may announce a virtual meeting will take place until the first and this will be effective until the first meeting of the next council's term. Yeah, it, it, this will be effective on including the first and through the first meeting through the until and including the first meeting of the next council's term. Is that that is the motion? Is there a second, Andy? <clears throat> Yeah, no, I was just going to suggest that uh, if you want to get to the clean wording, you, you would say effective immediately and until, uh, and then put that language in there. Until and including the first council, the first meeting of the next council's term. I'll second the motion. Yes, thank you. We've now got a much more grammatically correct motion. Um, after the word term, I believe you need a comma. Yeah. Okay. The motion's been made and seconded. Dorothy, you have a question, comment? Yeah, I, I am finding it very strange to say that if we have inclement weather, we don't have to do it. And we don't say in case of COVID epidemic. I mean, you know, there's other things that make it so we don't want to get together in person. So I, it's like it's like we had a big amnesia here. There will be other reasons besides inclement weather when at, at, you will say we can't meet in person. So I would hate to, I don't like the limitation that way. Just say good cause. You can change it with good cause. And that leaves it into common sense, which you have. So I'd find that fine. Uh, the motion's been made and seconded. Would you like to amend the motion? In the event of good cause. In the event of, in, of good cause, including clement weather. And, and epidemics or something. I mean, we no. have reasons why you don't want to have a public meeting that can come upon us rather quickly. We want COVID to be gone so badly that we're trying to forget it, but it's coming back. Right. The motion that I, I'm just trying to help. Some, somebody else could come up with better. In the words. event of inclement weather or other. Or health emergencies or something like that. Or at the, at the discretion of the president. Yes. The president um, May. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Good. Pat, do you have a question, comment? That motion was seconded by. Oh, Andy. yeah. Is there a second to that motion? 
Uh, I will assent, assent to that change. Okay, great. That motion's actually, we, what we've done now is accepted that as a friendly amendment to the motion. Pat. So let's done? vote. Okay. <laughs> Uh, Andy, do you have any final comment? Yeah, uh, I, I just... think there, there's one clarification that I need, and that is, are we talking about council meetings or council and council committee meetings? This is town council meetings only. The next one, we still have to do <laughs> committee meetings. <laughs> any further comment, question? All right. Seeing none, we're going to go to a vote. Um, this is Anika Lopes. Thanks. Anika? Yes. Michelle Miller? Aye. Dorothy Pam? Yes. Pam Rooney? Yes. Aunt Kathy Shane? Yes. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Aye. Alicia Walker. Aye. Shalini Palmilm. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. Lynn Griesmers. Aye. Mandy Johanneke. Aye. It is unanimous. All right. We're going on to committee meetings. The first one is to continue like we would be doing now, where we basically hold all public meet committee meetings virtually. And the second would move to an in-person format. Kathy? It says in person. In both. Oh, yes, it does. That's my mistake. All right, thank you. I think okay. the first one was supposed to read in the virtual. Yes, there we go. So now the first one basically allows us to meet virtually, but in this case, um, with virtual public access, because you can do that easily if you're virtually, okay? Until March 31st, 2023. If we go back above, we could pick up the comment about, you know, as long as the allows. To the top one. Okay, and then go up and pick up the other language about. I'm sorry, Kathy. On the first motion, you don't need anything more. It's all virtual. Okay. But but I do have a, a Mandy question. Joe, did you have any comment on the motion? Okay. Okay. So I just want to no. understand. I'm, am I commenting? Yes. Okay. My understanding on our choices here is that this is the only room on option two that that's possible. Oh, that yeah. it's that it's uh, it you can be in person and have virtual public access. If this is the only room that we currently can do that, do we really have the second option is my question. If you have overlapping meetings, you can't. Right, I just, you know, if we have overlapping meetings, um, town staff, uh, and mm -hmm. I'm assuming when it says council meetings, it's not including the elementary school building committee meeting or the Jones Library Committee. It, it is those, not. It's the others. So we would always be in this room would be, and then we would have to make sure we don't have any meeting at the same time. Correct? Right. For That's two. correct. Okay. Mandy Cho. So I don't know what to do with this one. Uh, as many people know, even before this council was 
was sworn in, I have been pushing for us going back to in-person um, for both council and committee meetings um, with sort of virtual public access. Um, in the last two years or so, um, even though I still don't really like virtual meetings, um, even for committee meetings, I see the benefit to um, counselors in terms of at least the flexibility of being able to attend meetings um, if they're traveling or just the flexibility for those that have jobs, um, especially jobs that might not be in Amherst to not have to travel up to Amherst to attend a committee meeting, which I believe allows our counselors to attend meetings at times they might not otherwise be able What's to attend meetings. Um, so um, I'm struggling with which I would support on this one. Um, I have a feeling I'm a losing battle on getting committees back in person. Um, and that if we went that way, that given the state of the state law right now, that I might be one of only one or maybe two people that might choose to show up in person. Um, so, you know, that leads me to probably I'd end up voting for whichever one has moved, but I just wanted to say that, you know, my thinking on this, given how strident I've been in the past, my thinking on this is evolving. <laughs> Pam's over there like, woohoo. <laughs> She's actually said it. Um, Andy. So the reason I raised the que question on the first one, but now we're getting to it for real, the second, uh, I think that we need to be very concerned about staff time to man virtual meetings that are also in-person meetings. We've already talked about that significantly. There was a push in the House of Representatives to do just that as a requirement and a really big pushback, including from our own staff to that proposal. Uh, I think it's, uh, would, it's not a good use of our IT staff time. Therefore, I would, at this point, as long as we're permitted to do it by statute, just do our meetings virtual. I'm going to make a motion effective immediately and until and including the first meeting of the next council's term to hold all town, town, town council committee meetings in the virtual meeting format with virtual public access. Is there a second? Second, Rooney. Or, Ma Ma Mandy Jess. Sorry, I just want to make one more comment. I'm, I'm going to vote for the motion, but is there a way we can think about if there's a particular meeting that we really think would be helpful to have in person to to be able to discuss, you know, I, I don't know how to, I wouldn't necessarily put that in this motion, but I can foresee something where we might say, you know, there's a lot of big um, visuals that we want some interactive public, you know, community forums where you're like, hey, it would be nice to get public to put stickies on things and stuff like that, that we can't really do virtually that um, figure out a way to have those discussions and maybe have some of those special committee meetings in person. I can't point to anything particular right now, but as we get involved, particularly towards design guidelines, I can see it might be very helpful to have some meetings in person. And there may be special meeting access for that yeah. kind of thing. All right, um, does this need something about being consistent with the law? Because once we, once March 31st rolls around, we would not be allowed to do this. It could say until the first meeting in the next council's term, unless inconsistent with law, with state law, something like that. While she's thinking about that, Kathy, you have your hand up. So I'm totally supportive of this. However, we amended to get all those other words in, but Mandy's suggestion, I'd like to come back to not at this meeting because we just were running into that with a subcommittee of the elementary school building committee by saying they have to be virtual 
we can't meet in person. And there are some times we'd like to meet in a small group, including the public in a room. And we're in a, a tight jacket the way we've done this. We don't have a, mm -hmm. in certain circumstances, we can do something. Um, yeah. So I'd just like to have some thought on how we can creatively on occasion decide differently. I'm actually gonna throw this back to GOL to look at our rules of procedure to see if they can put something in there under your various different meeting options. I knew you'd love that, Michelle. I don't think it's a rules thing right now because the only reason we're virtual is by virtue of a state law. Yeah, you're right. Um, let's just discuss it at a future meeting. Michelle? Well, that was kind of leading to my question. So. After March 31st, there is nothing that we could do that would allow us to continue this format. We would have That's, to. That, that is correct. Okay. So given that I'm just, and given the concerns about staff time and not having enough rooms that could handle, would it mean that beyond March 31st, everything would have to be in person for council committee meetings? So yes people and counselors, there'd be no Zoom whatsoever. It would mean that the, a majority of the people, a majority of the council would have to be in the room and the person presiding would have to be in the room and the note taker would have to be in the room. But and if there was somebody who got, filled out the thing, you know, the ex, 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 exemption, um, how would they be accommodated? They just, I guess, would have to go into the council room. Um, if I may. It, yes, please. Um, so after March 31st, 2023, unless there's another round of special legislation, um, members would need to request, they would fill out and submit a remote participation request form to the committee chair as early as possible. And the committee chair would approve or deny the request. Um, chairs would have to be aware that they would need a quorum in the room. So if they're finding that there are more requests than would allow a quorum to be in the room, they would have to make decisions about whether or not to hold that meeting or to reschedule it. Or wow. work with members about <laughs> how right. to have people in the room. And if I could make a prediction, the fact that we have a new legislature coming in on January and they're supposed to deal with this by March 31st, they're gonna just end up extending it again until they can come up with a better resolution. Um, the motion on the floor is the following. I've accepted this as a friendly amendment, effective immediately and until the including, until and including the first meeting of the next town council's term, unless inconsistent with state law, to hold all town council committee meetings in the virtual meeting format with virtual public access. Is there is was there a second? And do you accept those friendly amendments? Yes. Thank you. Any other further discussion or question? Seeing none, we're going to move to the vote. We're, um, Michelle Hugh Miller. Aye. Dorothy Pam. Yes. Pam Rooney. Aye. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Aye. Alicia Walker. Yes. Shalini Bell Milne. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. Lynn Griesmers and I, Mandy Johanneke. Aye. And Anika Lopes. Aye. It's unanimous. We have no other, no other votes tonight that I'm aware of. Um, the next item is for information only, although I certainly invite discussion and feedback. Uh, it is with regard to the town manager's evaluation. Uh, earlier, I guess it was at the end of August that I met with GOL. Uh, we reviewed the town manager evaluation calendar. Based on that, I have made a significant revision, shortening the time. And uh, the revised calendar and example instruments are in your packet. We are required by the charter to evaluate the town manager every year. As I've said in the GOL meeting, Amherst takes this beyond what most towns ever even would think about. Uh, I would love to see a way that we could not make this as onerous. 
but this is what we have at the moment. So our, we can pull it down the calendar up if you want, but um, unless people have questions, I'm willing to just keep moving on. This is something that all town councilors must participate in. You must, you must submit a written evaluation and it, it does become public, okay? Questions? Seeing none, We're, we have no appointments tonight. We're going on to commit committee and liaison reports. Mandy Joe, CRC. Thanks. Um, CRC, back in early August, um, put out a bulletin board notice for the three ZBA associate vacancies. We do not yet have enough applications to declare the pool sufficient. So that is my first notice to the rest of the council. Um, keep working on finding people who might want to serve on the ZBA as an associate member. Um, the other main thing um, CRC has been working on is rental permitting. And we are getting close to having a draft of a full bylaw. Um, that draft is very much in flux though, but I would say that we're getting close to having language in every section. Um, so that means that um, chairs of TSO and finance will be hearing from me about discussions needed to take place regarding fee structures, um, regarding who does fees, um, and potentially regarding who does regulations and what they may look like. Um, so I will probably be pulling at least for TSO and CRC after talking to the TSO chair, the possibility of having a joint meeting to save some sort of meeting for someone. Um, but look for that. I think we've got a council public dialogue or a council main discussion scheduled for October 17th. 17th. Um, and CRC is hoping, although it has not set, that we will have another community forum the week after on the 24th um, that we'll be able to hear about specific concerns, questions, comments regarding the language that is out there at that time. Um, for the manager, I'll be emailing you about some need for attorney um, consultation and potentially attorney attendance at CRC um, because we know we've got some concerns probably with the landlord tenant law and how we can write stuff into the bylaw. Um, and then the final thing is we're still in the middle of flood maps. Um, we're hoping to be able to get them to GOL um, by the end of our next meeting on September 29th, 29th, 20, 29th's the meeting, right? Um, but um, that all depends on getting the final firm maps and um, the report um, from FEMA before we can close our hearings and do our voting to get it to GOL. So it's going, the hearing is still open, so we're not under any 90 day deadline to pass yet, but we are now currently counting down our six month deadline, which started in late August. Right. And I have the possibility that the earliest the flood maps would come to the town council is October 17th. That is the earliest. Okay, Andy, you have a question? Yes, uh, can we have joint committee meetings if it involves a quorum of the council and the council is ultimately going to have to act? So it might end up being a full council meeting yeah. um, between the three committees. Every single counselor serves on one of those three committees. So at that point, we might just on some of these do a full committee, a full council meeting. Or do you um, want it to be an item at a council well, meeting? So we, yeah. I, I wanna talk to see with the chairs first um, on timing, right. but it, we may end up coming to you and saying, we just need it on a council meeting. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I, and I appreciate that complexity, okay? Uh, Andy, good catch. Uh, the uh, elementary school building committee, Kathy? Uh, yes, and uh, you don't have a written report, but I will do one for the next uh, meeting because uh, I want to have everyone know our timeline. On August 31st, I think you saw our, uh, we did a press release, it got written up. The MSBA approved the schematic report um, unanimously, and we had met with them a week or two before that with something they call a facilities committee where they could ask questions. and. They basically praised us on a whole 
uh, on a range of issues and people came away going hooray, you know, both in the education plan, the building scope. So it was unanimous support. What that means is we're now in designing the building um, with a, a lot more specificity than before. We had floor layouts, but now it's what the building is going to look like, what the exterior inside um, color schemes that allow us to get to a revised cost estimate that will be, you know, what are the materials um, and making those tough decisions that the library is now going through trying to take things out of their building. But, you know, thinking, you know, is it brick, is it mortar? We are on a schedule to be doing that over the next few months so that we can get another cost estimate either November or December. And I'm a little hazy there just, because when we're, we're target, we have to go to another MSB, the granting authority meeting with the final design. They have to vote on it. And that's when we get the official, how much their share will be. So that triggers a meeting with the council on to vote this move forward with the, the debt exclusion, but also going out to vote with the town. The two potential MSBA meetings are March, but it would be the very beginning of March and April, there are fortunate two choices. So we're gonna look at our schedule in terms of when we have to make decisions to get there because the that first date, March, the beginning of it, we would have to get everything done by December 28th. It's weird the way they've set things up, which hits Thanksgiving and holiday. So Lynn, I'm gonna come back to you to just talk yeah, about this the council is, meetings and discussion. This is starting to throw off what I thought was the schedule. Right, so that's, it's it's a potential revision, but we, we need to bring it to the committee okay. too, because this is just what is what is feasible. So it's exactly right, you know, and we, we can um, go out for a vote before we get the final MSBA uh, finding on this. It's on you. It's not what most towns do. They usually get the right. MSBA determination first. So, so it, it's that's just a time. It's a timing issue. But in the meantime, last meeting, and I'll share this picture in a report I do. We saw the first three D picture of what this building would look like. So it started to feel like a building rather than a bunch of floors, and it's starting to look very exciting. Um, with you know, putting some flesh on the bones of it and what's the color of the brick gonna be or where is it brick? What's the entrance look like? So stay tuned on that for some pictures that start to look like a building. Okay, we need to meet sooner rather than later and keeping in mind that we don't want to go out to the voters any later than about the end of April. I mean, because once you start getting into May, then you start getting, well, the university's not really in session and, you know, a bunch of other stuff, okay? Yeah, and, you know, I know, and so that's the timing of this, that the March meeting is like March 1st and the April meeting is April 26th. So that's, you know, the, the, okay. those are the... And, and then there's also the issue of how much in, in advance you have to set the ballot question. Yep. Okay. Uh, got it. Okay, that's news. Uh, finance committee, Andy. Yeah, the finance committee, uh, you've thrown a lot at us, and uh, <laughs> so I do need to point that out. <clears throat> we spent the entire last meeting on the library discussion, and we are planning again to meet tomorrow at 3 30 to continue the discussion on library and hopefully get the answers uh, to as many of the questions as possible. We have left the possibility in the agenda as it was written this time that we may make a recommendation um, or uh, as, as action, but uh, which was not an option that we had on the agenda last time because we didn't want to go there. Um, so that's a major piece and uh, we, um, but you've also asked us to look at trash hauling as a town service, street light modifications, street acceptance of Hopbrook and Kestrel Lane, um, 
special real estate act uh, that was uh, referred to the committee that would, uh, needs to go then to the legislature. So there's time pressure ultimately on that. Um, and uh, we also have the standard items that need to be covered by the committee um, because we're getting towards the time when um, the council will be receiving the um, projections for the next fiscal year. And um, that kicks in process a whole beginning of the next process and uh, doing a draft of the uh, council guidelines. So um, I'm not sure how we can manage all of this, quite frankly, and we are gonna have to discuss it as finance committee and uh, we may have to come back to you and sort of throw a reality check on it. There are also a number of policy issues that we're aware of that might be referred to the committee in addition. So um, at this point, um, oh, and one other thing of course is that uh, once the uh, uh, free cash is certified, then there'll be decisions that have to be made about what to recommend to the council regarding um, any transfers to stabilization funds. Um, so um, that's just one more item to add to that long list that I've talked about. So I uh, just sort of forewarn you that I think that we as a committee need to think about what our capacity is and decide whether we need to come back to the council for guidance. Um, that's a committee decision. I have not had the opportunity to talk with the committee about it because in our last meeting, we really just talked about library. So um, no other report at this point, but it's sort of a, a forecast of where we might be going. Thanks, Andy. Um, <coughs> GOL, Michelle. We have our work cut out for us as well. I think we talked about a lot of um, a lot of the items already, but we'll be continuing to do a review of bylaws, our equity lens review process, uh, the town manager evaluation, of course, um, and then when it's ready, the new special legislation. Um, there will be proclamations um, as we are going forward as well. So um, there's nothing really other than that to add right now. Thank you. Anika Jones Library. As if we had that <laughs> Yes. Is there anything uh, else you'd like to yeah, add? Well, you know, aside from the conversation tonight, which was also continued in the town manager report, um, I would say if anyone wants to dive even deeper, uh, there's always the website and the newsletter that comes out is great. And I think, you know, the additional information that will come out, I guess, will be tomorrow, which will explain um, the additional cuts that were just uh, made at the uh, last uh, building committee meeting. Thank you. As I move on to TSO, I want to acknowledge and thank Dorothy for her service as chair of TSO. Dorothy had notified me and I have notified the committee that she is not able to continue in that capacity given her other obligations, particularly to um, Holyoke Community College. So I will be opening the meeting of TSO this Thursday at seven o'clock. Uh, and our first job will be to elect a chair and vice chair. And then I will also be setting the agenda for that meeting and be there to make sure that it continues as we hoped. Dorothy, did you have any other comments you would like to make? Uh, just to um, alert people that we have changed the date. We originally had thought we were gonna have the uh, public forum on the Lincoln Avenue parking issue on September 15th. And then we discovered the, the block, the bid was coming up with the block party and felt that pent up demand would, people would wanna be having, having fun on the street. So that will be uh, rescheduled most likely to October 13th, but that will be done officially at the coming TSO meeting at seven o'clock. And TSO continues to be busy with, as I say, the parking issue um, and the Hope uh, Church parking request water and sewer bylaws and regulations, 
and the engagement and outreach policy, beginning to look at then universal composting and the proposed street lighting policy and many more things that we've discussed tonight. So I do want to say that I am um, you know, grateful for the chance to serve as chair and looking forward to uh, helping elect a new chair at our next meeting. Thank you. Great, thank you. Liaison reports, particular comments there. Michelle. Um, if it's okay with you, Lynn, I wanted to offer a short report um, from the African Heritage Reparation Assembly, given I'm sort of in sure. the role of liaison. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to announce some exciting um, aspects of our work. Uh, first, we are kicking off our community engagement campaign this week, um, particularly at the block party. So we're going to have a table at the block party. Um, and our community engagement campaign will include an Engage Amherst um, page, which we've been working with Brianna on, and uh, she's been so helpful, and we're really, really excited about that. It's also going to include a portal for residents of African heritage to include themselves, to be notified, and to participate in our process. Um, so we're really excited about that. Um, and then we will engaging in some boots on the ground, um, canvassing using the census that we worked on with the Dunahue Institute. Um, so I would love to be able to share out that information with uh, you all to share with others, um, particularly really wanting to get residents of African heritage to engage um, right now in the process. And uh, another exciting piece of information is that we entered into a collaboration with the Student Senate at Amherst College. Um, and they are going to be making a monetary donation to the uh, fund, as well as participating in boots on the ground, like canvassing um, and taking our uh, marketing materials out into the community, again, using the census. Um, and then finally, uh, I had an excellent meeting today with Senator Comerford and Rep. Dom about the special legislation. That was something that we had discussed as a next step uh, that I would talk to them about strategy. And it went really well. I'm going to do a written report for that and provide it to the council. Um, so those, those were the updates for the African Heritage Reparation Assembly. And then I also attended the Board of Health meeting this past week. Uh, I'm the liaison for that committee, and uh, it's a really great committee and so interesting to, to, to listen in on. Um, they just work on so many different things that are pertinent to the community. Um, the town manager's report covered most of the director's report, but I'll also add that they are entering into the third phase of their community assessment. They've worked with UMass public health students to do that. I think it's gonna be really exciting. Um, they also talked about gun violence as a public health epidemic. Um, and then they um, are approving multiple residential geothermal well applications, which is really interesting. Um, a lot of um, residents are, are seeking that. So um, anyone uh, have any questions about the Board of Health, just let me know, but it was a, it was a great meeting. Thank you. Thank you for both. Jennifer? Uh, yes, just very briefly um, that the Amherst uh, Municipal Affordable Housing Trust met last week. And I guess the um, the most, well, one of the items that was really exciting they talked about uh, for extensively was um, Valley CDC purchased eight acres in North Amherst and they're planning to build 32 to three bedroom duplexes um, for home ownership. And uh, I believe that they were at the donor meeting yesterday. So people in uh, district one um, are very up to date. And so that's very exciting. So that's one of the projects that was discussed. And the other announcement I wanted to make for the housing trust is that they are having um, a um, webinar and a forum tomorrow online, um, September 13th at 6.30 p p.m. It'll be on Zoom, again, focused on affordable housing. And there should be, um, I can send it to the council, but there should be a link on their website to that webinar. And that's it, thanks. Thank you, Pat. Thank you. Um, the um, 
Community Safety and Social Justice Committee la met last week, and um, they are charged, as we know, with providing support and advice to all town entities, including the town council, town manager, town departments, and town committees. And to do this, the uh, Community Safety and Social Justice Committee needs an active seat at the table. The committee is concerned that there's been a lack of meeting participation by town staff, delays in requests for information, and a lack of responses to queries sent to the CREST, the finance department, the town manager, and the council. To be effective, the community safety working group needs uh, staff help in expanding their understanding of and ability to participate in the town budgeting process, writing proposals for CPA and CDBG funds, and with grant writing. Currently, the uh, Community Safety and Social Justice Committee is requesting direct information about the distribution of ARPA funds and regular updates from the DEI department and the Community Responders Program about their ongoing work. In addition, uh, CSSJC would like to work directly with the Chamber of Commerce and the bid to gather uh, information about ongoing outreach to and participation by businesses owned by BIPOC and other mar marginalized entrepreneurs. So it's a, a very uh, demanding group and a very exciting group to work with. Thank you, Kathy. Um, I'm just going to do a quick report that the Community uh, Preservation Act proposal window is open right now. Um, so as Jennifer just talked about the Valley CDC uh, enterprise, they're going to be applying. So it's open until September 30th. Um, and so that's been the meeting so far, just that it's been posted and seeking proposals. So you can go on the website to see the web page to see how much money they have available, but this begins their process and deliberation. And for those of you who haven't followed this before, when they get proposals, they're all put up. You can see them and then the committee itself writes comments and questions and the answers to those are put up before they actually vote on the allocation of funds. So it's a good process to watch, if, particularly if there are specific proposals you wanna follow. And just to build on Jennifer's on the proposal for the housing development up in North Amherst. People were really excited on the Valley CDC and what was fun to see. And one of the reasons I like in person for some things is they had a giant table set up with the map and people could move the houses around to literally say what it would, what it would look like this way and that way, which was um, the peop two people who were on the trust we're at that meeting saying this was so much better for them to get a sense of what this must look like. So it would be a good piece probably for them to think about how they bring that ability um, when we're, we're doing other community housing developments to really make it real to people. It was a great meeting to see that. Dorothy, you have your hand up. Yes, I'm also a liaison to CSSJC. And um, I will say that uh, Councilor DeAngelo's report was excellent. Um, I would just add that there were concerns about uh, not sufficient outreach to the BIPOC community with some of the ARPA money and continued concern about where is or where will be the funding for the BIPOC Center, the Youth Empowerment Center, the Residential Oversight Board. And they are worried that DEI and CRESS um, are we'll need more funding. They also mentioned um, a victim's compensation fund in reference to the um, July 5th episode. So, um, but I thought we, that was a great report. It's a very strong committee and it's doing very important work. Thank you. Any other comments? Uh, moving on to the town manager's report, Paul. Thank you. So uh, you have my report, written report. Just a couple of things I want to mention. One is that we're doing a cup of joe with the um, Board of Health staff, our health director and public health nurse on Thursday at the Banks Community Center. Uh, second is that, um, thank goodness, we've got a lot of rain and that really helped us in our, during the drought. We're not out of the drought that still exists, but 
Uh, our Atkins Reservoir rose by about a foot. We haven't really had any stress on our system this summer and to date, and even with the students returning, which is a time when we were really looking forward to it, uh, to watching it, what was happening to it. We'll have a more detailed report that I'll share with you by the end of this week in terms of with, when we get our um, numbers uh, through um, the beginning of the school year. Um, and then the last thing that I can mention and answer any questions that you may have is the block party um, is on Thursday and it's a pretty big event. It's the biggest one they have organized for quite some time. Any questions or comments anybody has? Questions? Dorothy? Well, as usual, I, I find the uh, town manager's report fascinating reading. And I'm looking at the health department has started the childhood immunization program, which sounds like a wonderful um, outreach program. And I'm just wondering if you want to say something about that. Sure. Yeah. So it's a um, the strategy in the past had been to not provide immunizations to uh, children in the hope or the expectation or the encouragement that it was more important for the, the families to connect with a primary care physician to make sure that all their health needs were being covered. Um, this, they, the uh, prior health director felt that was a, a big uh, sort of opportunity to connect people. Um, I think the current health director saw that there's an immediate need. Students weren't able to go to school without the, without the um, vaccinations and uh, had the capacity with our new public health nurse to be able to offer that. And, and, and talking with the schools, they felt it was a very high need. So it's a really good thing. You know, there are certain requirements for you to be able to do it, but it, they mainly get the referrals from the school district where someone's presenting themselves wanting to attend the school. They need vaccinations. We can deliver their vaccinations to them. So it, it, it is a really good program. Okay. Jennifer? Yeah, just very quickly. This was actually a um, request that came from a constituent, which was, with the um, Engage Amherst, uh, you know, portal, and it was been, it's been so helpful with the residential rental property bylaw where people can just, you know, put in their thoughts. If it was possible to maybe add that for, um, you know, any of the other motions or proposed bylaw amendments, you know, that come before the council. Sure, I think they are doing one. Um, um, she is working on another one. Um, it takes time to set it up and it takes someone who's going to be the, per, the manager of it and who's going to be listening to it and responding to comments. But Brianna can set up something if there's a targeted thing. We don't want to overload because it does take a certain amount of time. And these are active sites that have to be managed to be successful. So, but if there's something that a counselor or the council would like to see, we can certainly look into it. Okay, thank you. So now, is it different if we just, I guess that would just be the engage, the comments that we have now where anybody can write in, like about waste taller or yeah. street lighting. Yeah. yeah, so if there was something, you know, if there's a particular initiative that the council is taking on and wanted more directed feedback where we are gathering information, that's, the, that's, a, that's an opportunity to use engage hours. The, the challenge we have is that we have just Brianna who's doing all of it, so. Um, okay, yeah. thank you. Alicia? Um, thank you, Lynn. Thank you, Paul. This was a great report. I have a question um, about whether we have a, uh, the town has a position for a sustainability director. Mm. Yes, I, you know, and I, I apologize. I should have put that in the report. We, I did promote um, Stephanie Ciccarello or cha we changed her job description to become sustainability director um, to meet, uh, to reflect more what she was actually doing um, and so um, that has already, that has been done. And, and I think what I need to do is provide an update on all the CARP sort of requests. And that was one of their primary requests. So we haven't done awesome. any announcement on that or anything yet. Okay, awesome, thank you. So that was gonna be my second half of the question um, was what their responsibilities were. So it's just updated and then, um, is there an updated job description as to what that person will exactly be doing or is it? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I can share that out if you'd like. Awesome, thank you. Thanks, Alicia, and congratulations to Stephanie. Um, Shalini. Uh, Paul, could we get an update on the community choice aggregation? Where is the town on that? 
you know, I don't know where that is right off the top of my head. I, I could have, I'd have to ask our sustainability director for that information. <laughs> All right, thank you. That's why she's promoted, so she can give the answers. Um, are there any other questions or comments at this time? All right, then let me just quickly do a couple uh, president's report issues. Uh, just note that the budget coordinating group, as I mentioned earlier, is meeting this coming week. Uh, the members that we voted into that, that were appointed to that group are counselors, Mandy Johanneke, Andy Steinberg, and myself. It is a public meeting so that any counselor who wishes to attend can do so in the audience. Um, I'll be doing a president's report for our meeting next week, and in it will give the summary of our most recent meeting with Joe Comerford, which included things like ranked choice voting, which I'm uh, waiting for an update from Mindy Dom. She thought she'd have it today or tomorrow. Um, we discussed library and school funding. We discussed cannabis legislation and recent actions on that. The upcoming library tour, the need for the list of town priorities and the residential transfer fee. But one of the most interesting parts of the discussion actually came prompted by Anna's question. And that was, are we hurting ourselves by filing special legislation, you know, several at a time? And the answer is no, uh, that they each stand on their own. And in many cases, as was discussed earlier, issues like the um, transfer fee uh, actually support existing legislation that uh, legislators are trying to get passed as well. Um, going on the UMass um, and town resources fairs, which uh, have been done in the past. There's three of them coming up. One is Fair, Fairview Way, and that's on the 22nd of September from 4 to 6.30. Fearing Street, which is going to be held on Allen Street. Okay. And then also the Grantwood Resource Fair, which will be held in Blackberry cul-de-sac um, on 9.29 at 4.30. Um, next, by next week, I hope to have a president's written president's report to you and our future meetings. And hopefully by October 3rd, come up with a proposed calendar for 2023. Um, so with that, um, under future agenda items, I wanna mention, oh, are there any questions for, the, for me? with regard to President's report. Okay, under future agenda items, please note that we meet at 5.30 next week for the master plan primer. This is a practice we started a couple of years ago. Basically, Chris Brestrup gives an overview of the master plan. And then at six o'clock, um, we do the public forum on the master plan. And at 6.30, we have a regular town council meeting. Uh, assuming any uh, specific issues that come up, we do hope to have a hearing uh, to, for Eversource with regard to Pomeroy Lane. We hope to have a referral of various financial items and a brief discussion about the town manager's goals that GOL has asked for. And I'm assuming that you'll go ahead with that. Uh, we'll bring the Jones Library back. Um, we have a gift of open space and the reading of bylaw 3.39 street numbers of all properties and various appointments from the town manager. Are there any questions? Yes, Andy Jo. So in an effort to shorten council meetings, um, you just mentioned that there will be a master plan primer, um, but our wonderful planning director, Chris Brestrup has done this now multiple years in a row. It's basically the same thing. And because we've been on Zoom, it is recorded now. Mm -hmm. um, could we just literally just put that recording on as the recording to watch if you need a master plan primer and then start the meeting at six with the public forum? Um that would be fine. In addition to that, though, let me just say that public forums actually don't require counselors to be there. I, I know, but if you're calling it as a council meeting. Okay. <laughs> All right, we'll look into that. 
to make to see what it looks like. But thank you. And Chris may actually appreciate that. We do then have to have an official public forum on the master plan. Um, are there other questions? Jennifer. Okay. Uh, so councilor comments, please go ahead. Jennifer. Yes, I, I neglected to mention that Dorothy and I are having a district three meeting this Saturday afternoon at two o'clock in my backyard, <laughs> 259 okay. Lincoln Avenue. You're all welcome, no pressure. I just learned that there's a football game that afternoon, UMass. Yes, so hopefully the two student houses behind my house will not be having a prep pep rally. Or you could just join them. Yeah. That's also the day that um, Joe Comfort's at the library. Um, Michelle? Similarly, Kathy and I are um, having a District 1 meeting on September 25th. I guess I, I could have said this next week, but early reminder, at 3 p.m., um, we're doing it in person at the Pioneer Valley co-housing um, in the octagon there or inside if it's not good weather. I also wanted to just quickly announce that um, we had a representative from the Amherst Community Land Trust join us at AHRA today. And they have a $125,000 subsidy available for a qualified first time home buyer. Um, it was a grant they received through CPA, I think a year ago, um, and the person they have fell through. Um, they didn't receive a lot of interest in their lottery program. So they're accepting applications first come first serve and they're really encouraging black residents to apply. Um, and, and would really like to see applications, um, you know, all applications will be looked at on a first come first serve basis. Um, but please spread the word and their website is Amherst Affordable Housing Trust org. And uh, it's a really exciting opportunity that's available right now just happened to open back up. Okay. Thanks. Are there any other comments or questions? Seeing none, um, the meeting is adjourned and it is 1054. <laughs>